Um, first, I want to thank Professor Shapiro for inviting me down here. It's one of my highlights of the year to come down and talk to you. It's a great program. I'm so jealous about all the things you've got going. You're really fortunate to be in this program, and um, uh, you're going to have a great uh, uh, two years. Is that right? And maybe I'll even see a few of you in my course up on the law school. But uh, this program is great because it's so integrated into what's happening in Washington and bringing people out here and going down to Greenpeace. I, um, I was on the Greenpeace US board for many years. And <clears throat> so I have a great affinity to, for Bill Richardson and the people you'll meet down there. And they do put on a nice show. It's a great office. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about international law um, and kind of juxtapose it a little bit for, from international policy and global policy and, um, and talk about, I'm not going to really go through the readings in order. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the sources of international law and where the field of international environmental law as opposed to policy is. And then maybe talk about climate change and then talk about whatever you guys are interested in talking about. So, uh, and I'll make sure that I do a few of the things and answer some of the questions that were posted about the difference between hard and soft law and things like that. Um, any questions so far? <laughs> Good. Uh, um, so the, the um, thing about international law is that it's, to know, it's really conservative. And it's very, in, in my view, stilted and a little bit narrow. Um, technical and um, political also. Um, and uh, not wholly adequate up to the task of protecting the global environment. So. I'll say that out. And the way that I like to describe this is sort of a understanding the culture of international law. The culture of international law is very conservative. Um, in fact, I speak of a clash of cultures between the international environmental lawyers, and I put myself in that group, and the international environmental activists, um, and international law, and international lawyers. And this clash goes something like this. I mean, international lawyers traditionally are State Department lawyers. The legal department of the, of the US State Department is just about the most conservative group of international lawyers on the face of the planet. Not personally. Some of them are Democrats and progressive and stuff like that. But their job is to make sure international law grows slowly. Why do they want it to grow slowly? Because the law constrains. And what don't they want it to constrain? US power. So the State Department, on one hand, when you go to the lawyers in the State Department and you ask them what the international law is, they are going to be as slow as possible to watch the evolution of international law. Because what is law? What is international law? But the relationship between states and the, and the effort to try to constrain the discretion, the behavior, the actions of, of, of states, of nation states. They're the only actors in international law. So um, countries are a little slow to want to have international law develop, in my view. Um, they go very slowly because it's an awesome thing, the idea that you're going to create law that's going to constrain the use of uh, military force, for example. Or to, or to shape the sovereignty and the sovereign powers of a, of a government. So they take it very, very seriously. And as I say, the State Department goes particularly slowly, but all State Departments do. I mean, the only way you practice international law when I emerged from law school in 1986, um, you know, there was no field of international environmental law. And international law was dominated by State Department diplomats. Um, some academic writers, you could stay in academia and write about international law and hope you could move governments along. Um, and um, yeah, that's it. You're basically in the State Department, so you're in, uh, in a diplomat, or you're in academia. The idea of doing public interest international law, of representing people, or affected communities, or even companies, uh, the idea that international law could expand to, to reach this was not that common. And, and we still, to this day, talk about public international law as being this law between states. And the people who have a voice in that, the types of people who have a voice in that, are pretty narrow. Um, and that presents a real challenge for international environmental issues, because um, we don't want to go slow. We've got a problem out there. The planet's burning up. People's human rights are being violated. And um, we've got uh, uh, expansion of extractive industries all over the world with not a very good set of environmental standards always. And so we have, um, uh, you know, we want to go faster. And I know that when I started to work in international environmental law, when I joined the Center for International Environmental Law as it was just starting, this was a nonprofit organization, the idea was that international law should reflect, hey Joe, should reflect ethics and spirituality and morality and not just, like Joe, and not just um, 
uh, the whims of states. But more than that, it was, or not more than that, as part of that, it was about who could participate. And I, um, uh, and that's why I say it was a bit of a clash of cultures. We came in with our long hair and our beards, and our goal as international environmental lawyers was to protect the environment. And we, we came to international law with the idea that here was a tool that was underutilized, international law. We were, we were CL, for, exa for example, and some of the other environmental nonprofits that started doing international law, they were weaned, at least in the United States, on the idea of citizens being able to bring lawsuits, to use environmental law to protect the environment. And, we, and, and the problem was that some of the cases were starting to have transboundary impacts or global impacts. And domestic law didn't seem to reach it. So there was this thing called international law. So we should get that as a tool to protect the environment. Uh, and so that was sort of how this new generation, myself included, of international, of environmental lawyers became international environmental lawyers. I never was going to be an international lawyer. I was going to be an environmental activist, but it seemed like there were issues that we needed this tool. The problem was that the tool is very much shaped by uh, the power and influence of states. And traditionally, only states can be an actors to it. So on the one hand, you've got these um, kind of slow, don't move too fast, Hunter. Don't move too fast on international environmental law, because you'll undermine the, 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 the growth of international law. And as soon as you don't have consensus, if you go too fast, you break consensus, and then the, the house of cards start to tumble down. There are, and, and the way I view it is, in some ways, well, then you know, sort of the emperor with no clothes. You see the weakness of international law if you can't push it. But for the international lawyers not to not to be too um, critical of them, they have a different agenda. They have a long-term agenda of trying to constrain state power through this idea of law, which itself is an, an enormously uh, big agenda and really important. The problem is the pace that they go is way too slow to protect the global environment. You know, we're, we can see it in so many different ways, but we need action faster, and international law goes slow. And it, it drives me crazy, and it, it, it created this incredible conflict. Uh, of cultures, because we would be in meetings all the time, and they would, if they called on us at all, they would say, you know, we'd be pushing the principles or pushing the law, and they'd say, but that's not the law yet, and you, you can't do it. And we'd say, yeah, but we got a problem. Let's change the law. Well, you can't change the law unless you fit into some of these formal structures of what law is. And so, um, this has become the sort of playground for, for this conflict, and we see international environmental legal activists trying to push the envelope forward and trying to get. Um, the international law to move in new and different ways. And so if, one way to even see the hard law, soft law distinction is a distinction between those who want to stick to the categories of hard law and say you have to go, that's what law is, and others saying, I don't care what law is, can we get some tools to help protect the environment? And whether we label it something else or not, let's use those in the global context. And, and in addition, you see this in the, in the change in voice about who's participating. Um, Again, in the, in the traditional view of international law, the only subjects of international law are states. The only people who get to participate are states or their representatives, meaning if you want to be an international lawyer, you go to the State Department and become immediately very conservative about what law should be. Um, or you write about it in an academic field and be slightly ignored. You know, but, <laughs> or, or over time have a huge influence, but it's over a long period of time. But the idea that you could bring the voice of the public interest or of private sector actors into it was, was kind of new and odd. I always recount a story of um, uh, dealing with the World Bank, and I was in a conflict with the general counsel of the World Bank, who was a famous international lawyer named Ibrahim Shihata. He was Egyptian. He was a great international lawyer, but just steeped in decades of this tradition that international law was um, the relationship between the states. And the specific conflict had to do with um, something called the World Bank Inspection Panel, which um, was something that I'd worked on and helped to design. And the inspection panel was the first uh, at the World Bank. The World Bank became the first international organization to allow uh, a citizen to file a complaint about the bank's own operations without first going through their state. So if we think about this, con this conversation about who has a role to play in international law, the inspection panel was, was a unique innovation because suddenly affected people had standing of a sort to raise concerns about the bank's own operations. And they didn't have to do it through the diplomatic channels. They could do it directly with the bank. So it was an interesting innovation in international law. But the question came out about who would have um, the ability to um, define the legal obligations of the panel. Who would do the legal um, 
advice for the panel. None of this is really relevant, but uh, that was the conflict because he was the general counsel of the World Bank and said, this is an institute of the World Bank. I have to be the one that gives the legal opinions. And I, from the outside, was saying, uh, no, that's a conflict of interest. The claimants are bringing a case against the management of the bank, saying that you violated your environmental, human rights, and social policies. Um, and they've come to the panel. And then if there's going to be a question about the needs to be interpreted, the panel needs to give its own outside legal opinion and not rely on the general counsel. He didn't like that too much. Um, so he asked for a meeting. I didn't realize at the time, it was the first time he'd ever met with anybody from civil society. And when I walked in to the meeting, he said, very nice gentleman. And I dressed up. I was with Laura Udall of the Udall family, who was um, also a great, who still is a great environmental, international environmental activist lawyer. And she and I walked in to make our case. And we looked pretty good. I had a suit and tie on. I looked better than I do today. I took my Tevas off, put on my clothes, no sh shoes, and trimmed up my beard. I probably still had a, I, I might have had my baseball cap on. I don't know. But I looked pretty good. I had my suit on. And I walked in, and the opening remark that I got, instead of a hello, was, I might have got a hello. But then the next line was, do you know how rare it is for someone like me to meet with somebody like you? <laughs> <Don't> you? <laughs> my zipper's off. <laughs> okay, I don't know what the problem is. And Lori looks great. And I, I'm thinking about it. And you know, I was a little offended. And I, I, you know, my first response was, well, that's interesting, because I met with your boss, the president of the bank, just last week. And we had a, this conversation. And, I'm, you know, and we think you're going to lose this argument. But it, it, it went downhill from there. It wasn't a very nice conversation. Until I came to realize, it took me another meeting or two, that what he meant by that wasn't actually an insult from his diplomatic perspective. He actually meant it as um, how rare it was for somebody who represented an international organization who only met with the states, whose accountability only ran from the organization to the member states, how rare it was for him to meet with somebody whose client was poor fisherman from Paraguay. He never met with anybody like that before. And I find that a, a sort of a metaphor for you know, where we were, how far we've got to go, and how far we've come in the sense of who has legitimacy to speak to the international organizations to speak in international law. He wasn't really saying that I was unwashed. He was just saying he was unused to dealing with citizens and communities and affected communities. And it wasn't remarkable that he was meeting with us. I mean, it was only, it was only remarkable because politically he could not not meet with us. We had him you know, wrapped up in different ways, and we were speaking to the board of directors and politically had to. But um, still, he recognized the, the distinction of the traditional old way of dealing with things. And this was in 1993. So it's not that long ago. But it does reflect where we had to come in international law. And I think we've come a lot further. Um, but the readings of, um, of Allot, which is kind of might feel a little, you know, a little old and outdated now, it's important to recognize this sort of uh, the sort of direction that we've come from time, and still to this day, we get we, we hit up against it. The arguments for sovereignty, the arguments for um, state to state relationship. I mean, to this day, the World Bank doesn't accept that it's um, subject to human rights law um, because its governments uh, won't allow it to say that, and because it believes its bylaws are, are narrowed and, and enough so that they don't have to reflect on it. Um, and that their responsibilities only run to states. And if they have any human rights obligations, it's actually the obligations of the states, not them as an organization. Um, and so there's a lot of, of this um, holdover still from this traditional way of, of uh, looking at international law. And it still shapes how, how we do it, how we do things. But on the other hand, international environmental law has been pushing this envelope. I remember another time when I was pushing a uh, the precautionary principle, which we'll talk about. And I was pushing it as a saying in some documents that it was a binding principle of international law. I knew it wasn't by traditional views, but I, I wasn't going to be caught publicly saying it wasn't. I was trying to push the US. And I just got, you know, I remember being reamed out by some State Department and um, uh, US EPA lawyers for not being a good lawyer. This is the attack they say because I didn't understand what international law was. I totally understand what international law, law, law was. But that was the attack they would do on lawyers. If you're not careful about the sources of international lawyer, then you're not a careful lawyer, and you're not part of the club. Uh, and the club is this, you know, respecting these traditional sources, which I'll go through right now. And it, so it's a very powerful pressure, conservatizing pressure, against um, uh, progressive lawyering. Uh, or pushing the envelope in the law because you're 
Uh, it's not only not part of your club, but you know, it's the last thing you want to hear as a lawyer, that you're not a careful lawyer. Um, and it's like, yeah, I'm, I was careful. I knew exactly what I was doing. I was making a political statement, and the guy's a legal statement, and I'm trying to push the envelope. But um, they would continue as many times as they could to kind of attack the messenger in a way. This new breed of international environmental lawyer who wants to, you know, thinks about the project of protecting the global environment instead of the project of slowly developing international law. And I don't want to say that's not important. It's vitally important. And I have a great deal of respect for them. But there is this clash where we're trying to go faster because international law, if given their own way, they'll take 100 years to figure out how to develop international environmental principles. And we just don't have that much time. Uh, I've been doing it for 30 years. And we squandered a lot of time during my lifetime. You guys better get a little faster at it. OK, so that's sort of the clash of cultures. Um, and so we have to recognize in international law, it's very conservative. And, we, and it turns us to the sources of what international law is. Because whatever international law is, it's a box. And traditional lawyers view that's what international law is. And if we're doing something else, then we're, we're doing something that's not law. Um, and we can put a different label on it, like soft law or something else. But let's start with, if we're going to talk about the field of international environmental law, the sources of international law that the traditionalists want, would say is law. We might as well at least know that playground um, well if we're going to play in it sometimes. If I'm in, before the International Court of Justice, I very much want to know what they think the sources of international law are. If I'm playing in front of the New York Times, I care a little less. I'll call it international law if I want to call it international law. And we'll have a little conflict over whether I'm a good lawyer or not. Um, but it's important to start from understanding what international law is, and that people agree. And that are the sources of international law. What are they? Does anybody remember the sources of international law? It was in one of those chapters. What the traditionalists would say the sources are? Yeah. Uh, treaties, yeah, written work, some open ended category. It's sort of subservient source of law. So, very good. Treaties, custom, general principles, and then the writings of um, wise people. I'm still hoping that someday I'll be one of those wise people that will be. <laughs> She's what? Oh, you're from the law school. You haven't been in any of my classes, have you? You cheated. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember. So where, did you, where were you quoting? Besides my book, where were you quoting? The sources. Where do they come from? Does anybody know where the sources come from? Where are the sources of law? Those four categories, where do they, where do they come from? They come from the... Articles and Corporation of the International Court of Justice, Article 38J of the Articles of the, of the World Court. So that's, that was the world getting together, the governments diplomatically getting together and saying, we're going to create a world court to resolve disputes according to international law. We need to know where the sources of law are. Where are the sources of law? Um, <clears throat> well, they're in, um, uh, we're going to say what they are, and we're going to put them into the to the Articles of Incorporation. And so they list them in this article. These are the four sources of law that the World Court will look at. So if you're in a dispute in the World Court, you kind of want to know what law they're going to believe is law, because anything else you cite is going to be dismissed as not important. Um, and so because the World Court is so important generally to the idea of international law, um, it tends to reflect what everybody thinks the sources of international law are. There's some debate. We still discuss it sometimes, but um, at least what we consider to be hard binding law, there are those sources, those categories. Now, I'm going to go over them again. That's right where I'm going right now. Um, and also what the impacts are for our field, international environmental law. So the first is treaties. Um, well, I'll go over them, and then I'm going to go back over some of them again. The treaties are what we would expect a treaty to be. What's a treaty? I mean, just you had some idea of what a treaty is, whether you're in law school or not. What's a treaty? An agreement Yeah, so it's an agreement, and it's between two states. Again, state-state relationship for the most part. There's a few possible exception, examples where maybe there are treaties that don't involve a state, including, for example, international organizations in the state might reach an agreement that might be considered a treaty. Um, Sometimes subnational jurisdictions like, but, but those typically aren't viewed as treaties. Um, so a treaty is an agreement between two states. It doesn't have to be in writing, but it usually is. Um, uh, and it's uh, 
And it's pretty easy to understand. And in the environmental field, I'll come back to talk about treaties. It's a big part of our field. Um, and that's, that's the easy one to understand. But to recognize that a treaty is an agreement between states. So states are demonstrating through the agreement that they're giving up some of their sovereignty. Um, and so uh, that's an important aspect of international law. They're giving up their sovereignty and they're showing that they're willing to cooperate and make some concessions, some compromises, some agreements with one another. Um, uh, and they do this by, passing a, uh, by adopting a treaty. And it goes through several different stages of the negotiation where they agree, reach agreement. And then typically it has to be ratified. In the United States, the ratification process is typically through the US Senate um, by getting the advice and consent of the US Senate. Uh, and that is an important part of the story because that's not that easy to get in the US, especially right now. The US Senate can't agree on whether the sky is blue outside or not, or a little off blue, or light blue, or dark blue. Or They can't agree on anything, so they have difficulty agreeing uh, that they're going to support international treaties, and particularly when it comes to internationalism. Um, the US Senate has historically had um, difficulty with um, ratifying a lot of treaties, particularly including a lot of environmental treaties. And we can go back to that initial statement I said about why State Department lawyers are instinctively conservative um, often, because if you're giving up state sovereignty and you're the most powerful country in the world, then you only want to give it up on certain aspects. So you want to go slow in developing international law. You might want to go slow in addressing treaties as well, because you feel like you're giving up more than you're getting. Um, so that's treaties. Custom is a little bit harder. What's custom? Anybody have any idea of what custom is? Because if you do, you tell me, it'd be great. I'd like to know myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> custom is this kind of amorphous, um, well, it's not amorphous. It just feels a little different. It's, um, it's, a, it's a, a recognition by whoever the decision maker is, like the court of justice, that a principle has been adopted by the states through custom. And it has two parts to demonstrate it. One is um, uh, state practice, that most of the states of the world are, are acting a certain way. And they are doing it, and this is the Latin part. We won't have much Latin in the class, opinio juris, that they're doing it under a belief that it's legal. That's a legal obligation. So states are behaving in a certain way, and that they're doing it because they think it's legal. An illegal obligation. And if enough states, if mo virtually all states are acting in a certain way, and there's evidence that they're doing it because they think it's the law, then we can codify it into custom at some point. And so this is a potentially big area to grow. When I started in international environmental law, you know, treaties are one thing. We've got to get all the states to negotiate. We're going to work on that. But this custom seemed like an area that we could really grow by pushing the envelope and, and, and trying to, to um, uh, show that states are practicing a certain way, and that they're and that they're doing it under a legal obligation. How do you think? How would you? What kind of evidence would you use to show whether a state is acting under a legal obligation? I mean, state practice is observing and and documenting and things like that. But what about the other one? What about how do you, how would you think about proving? If you were trying to prove that a principle, like say, to do environmental impact assessment, was a principle of customary international law, um, and you looked around to state practice. You know, you might find that a lot of countries have it in international legislation. That might be state practice. But how do you get to this part about the international legal obligation? Yeah. Do they have like fines or something if, if a state or an individual is going to get a law? So, so, the, so the, they might, but but the the the, the it's good. The, but the but the real question for international law is it has to be that it's international law, not just that it's assumed to be domestic law, but that the reason that it became domestic law was because the state believed it was international law. And so where do you get that? Could you just ask yeah, I mean, yeah, you could ask. And you could also, where do we go to find out? So if the, if the US Congress or the parliaments from wherever you are pass a law, where do we go to find out um, why they pass the law? You know? Yeah, the Congress members, the legislative history. So we can look for policy statements in the newspaper, or we could ask them. We could do a, we could just ask, you know, are you acting under this way? Um, but we can get creative and start to look. What have they said in the newspaper? What have they said um, uh, when they passed the law? Have they, have they ever put this legal argument forward in an international case? So if they've done it in one case, um, and they said, we think this is an international legal principle, then later you could say, well, that's the 
That's the legal part. So it does open up some room. But the one thing that I leave you with, the non-legal aspect of it, is that it's really hard work and it's really slow. I mean, you've got to think about the world. And it's, it's not that you've got to get every country on board, but you've got to make a, a strong case that most of the world, if not all the world, uh, that it's nearly universally accepted. And this is a really slow process. It used to be a lot slower. Also, think about the 1990s, i.e., before the internet. Um, the idea of understanding what was happening in 100 different countries and trying to demonstrate and get this information was really daunting in the old days. It's what academics did. It's what international law academics did. They would research these principles, and they'd come out with really well-researched books that took them a lifetime to do to, that would explain why a certain principle should be considered customary international law. And it was, a, it was a valuable exercise, but it would take forever. And if you go back to the early 1990s and for this new era of international environmental lawyers coming up, and they look and they say, custom, great, we're going to move custom along. And then you run into this, oh, we've got to survey all the countries. We don't have the internet at the time. We've got to survey all the countries, and we've got to document that they're doing it. It's just like, oh, man, put the brakes on. It's like, if, if we're going to do that, we're going to all be bacon and climate change before long which we are anyways, but, but the point is that that's the slow process. And they, the reason why the international lawyers like it slow that way is because they're building consensus. If they're going to get the world to give up sovereignty in light of some customary principle, then it's really truly got to be something that's pretty universal. Um, it's got to be something that kind of demonstrates this over time because, again, what we're doing is we're creating a legal system that's going to oppose state power. Um, yeah, so um, how do we get custom? So there's a great example, um, it, it, almost an example, uh, where Amantri's, um, uh, where Amantri's descent, Justice Where Amantri's descent in the Gapchikovo case, which is excerpted in uh, chapter eight. Did you read chapter eight? Damn. The principles. Oh, no, 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 no. It's, it's actually in chapter six, isn't it? Did you read the, the one about sustainable development? And he goes through all the backgrounds of, um, of, of citing all the principles and all the different legal cultures. He's actually doing that as a general principle, to demonstrate a general principle. But it's kind of the same concept for how you would have to demonstrate um, uh, custom. Uh, you go into each of the countries. You look at what, what the laws that have been passed. You look for evidence that they have announce that they've done it for a certain reason, you know, that they've done it under the color of international law, and you build your case. So it's actually like writing a brief. When we write a brief in domestic law and we want to demonstrate what the law is, we, we go to the um, Congress and we get the law and then we argue over what it means. Um, in some ways, custom is the same way. The lawyers take a principle. So for example, I used environmental impact assessment. There's a, a debate right now, which we're slowly winning, that there should be a customary rule of law that all states, when they're doing a project that affects a transboundary impact, that they ought to do an environmental impact assessment of the transboundary impacts. This is a vibrant discussion within traditional international law circles about whether this is a customary rule. Now, if we wanted to show that that was, we would go to, first, all the legislation and judicial decisions of as many cases, countries as we could, and we would identify where the law includes environmental impact assessments over transboundary impacts. And then in addition, we would go and see why they passed that particular provision in their legislation. Did somebody say, oh, we did it because we want to be a good neighbor or because we think it's a legal obligation? Or did they cite some soft law doc document? Or did they just say in the court, uh, we think this is a legal obligation? And so then you build your case over time. And, and you win it when you convince the world court or some decision maker, like the Law of the Sea Tribunal or somewhere else, when they say, yeah, we think that's a customary principle. And then you've won it for that case. And so it is sort of a moving target, which is why, for the environmental activist lawyers, um, we're constantly trying to push that envelope. And we're trying to shortcut, well, maybe we only got 10 jurisdictions. We're still going to argue that this shows it's an emerging. We, then we, then we fudge, fudge it a little bit. We say it's an emerging principle of customary law, hoping that we'll convince the court to go all the way and say it. And the courts will sometimes. They, they, um, like, for example, in the, um, there's a case, uh, same principle, transboundary environmental impact assessment, which is why I used it, uh, the case involving um, Argentina and Uruguay and the two pulp mills that Uruguay was building on their side of the border. Uh, and it was going to uh, pollute over into Argentina. And Argentina brought the case. And the court, um, 
the, the court found that this was a principle of international environmental law. Now, they didn't find that it was a customary principle. They didn't find it was a general principle. They just said, we think it's a principle of international environmental law, kind of without doing any analysis. And also, in the next sentence, kind of indicating that both of the two countries agreed it was a principle, so they don't really have to go through the, all the analysis. Now, a whole bunch of academics and others are trying to argue, well, we've got the principle now. The court has found it, and even you know, we're fighting over whether they really did or not. But um, they didn't do all the analysis. But the briefs did. The briefs did a lot of analysis on the case. Um, and, and the court didn't give us all the analysis. But you know, is that emerging? Has it reached? We don't know. We'll know in the next case. So these things are fluid. Um, and where it matters is a case like that, where you're bringing one state against another state, and you're trying to convince the court that this is a rule that they should adopt. Um, and I would say the same thing about the general principle, the next category. It's even more nebulous. It's the general principles of civilized nations. And the court, um, so first we have to figure out what are civilized nations. Um, the ISIS caliphate is not, but once we move from there, there's some debate over who is and who isn't a, a legitimate state. Um, uh, but there again, it's sort of, it's not that every state has to have adopted the principle. And what do we mean by general principles? The way the court has used it has been that a general principle is not um, the way traditionally it's been viewed is that it's kind of a secondary source of law. The first two, custom and treaty, are, are clear and are clear historically that they're sources of law. But the general principles are a little bit um, less respected as a source of international law. The way you get them is you don't have to do the second part. You don't have to determine that um, it was done as a matter of international law. You just look around and say, look, all the major legal systems have the same principle of law in them. And therefore, it's a universal principle that we should respect in our own jurisprudence. But they typically don't use it um, to decide a case. They usually use it for secondary questions, that, like evidentiary questions, or procedural questions, or things that they need help on. So they're, you know, they're, they're the world court, and they've got a they've got to somehow function. So they, they use these general principles. And they say, look, all the great legal systems and traditions of the world have something similar to this. So we're going to incorporate it into the world court's jurisprudence. And they typically are reserved about doing that, except when they're trying to figure out um, the, pro the process. One of the famous ones was, uh, in all the legal systems of the world, there's something akin to what we call collateral estoppel. It means that if you prove something in one court case, a piece of evidentiary fact, then you don't have to reprove it in the second one. And all the great legal systems, Islamic, Confucian, uh, all the legal systems have something like this. And the court's looking for a way to treat evidence. And they look and say, well, all the legal systems do this. We're going we're to adopt this as well. That's the traditional use. But then in walks the environmentalists. And we look at general principles and we say, wow, this looks like a great area to grow substantive law. Um, and you see in that. Um, dissent from just, or that concurrence from Justice Wiramantri, that's what he's doing with sustainable development. He surveys all the religion, he surveys everything. He's not really doing an analysis of is it state practice plus opinio juris. He's really doing everybody's doing it. Everybody's got some concept in their history of sustainable development, so we should respect that and integrate it into our, our thing. I mean, there's a reason why that's not the majority opinion, and it's probably because he was uh, smoking too many of the same tea leaves that the um, uh, environmental activists were, and he got ahead of what you could really say was the consensus of international law, but he was pushing the envelope on sustainable development. And you see that in a lot of concurring opinions of the court where they will push forward. Um, so that's general principles. And then the, the legal writings. Unfortunately, it's not really my textbook or other things that they're talking about when they talk about sources of international law. They're really talking about um, publicists like the International Law Commission. Now, what's the International Law Commission? Well, not surprisingly, if we're going to think of it as a source of international law, it's a commission where the members are appointed by the governments. They sort of feel like they're legal ex experts, but they're also, if they're appointed by the governments, they're not long-haired hippies like me trying to pr push things forward. They're people that are traditionally right in the center of the international law traditions, and they'll move the law slowly. Uh, so the courts are comfortable with what the International Law Commission does as a potential source of codifying law. Um, again, usually as a, a, a secondary uh, source. Now, one of the things that all those sources have in common is that they're trying to reflect state consent. 
that the state has consented in some ways. So treaty is clear. They've, I, we've consented because we signed on the treaty. Custom, the consent is that we are practicing under international law. General principle is a little less clear, but if all great systems are doing it, then you can kind of imply the consent. And even with the publicists, which is why it's secondary, the ones they really look at are ones that are tied to the UN or to the international legal systems. And now why is consent so important? Because if we look back again at the legal structure of the world, we have sovereignty, and what happens within the country, within the bounds of the country, is the domestic law area. What happens within the country is a sovereign decision of that country. If you want to do international law, or if you want to impose something on that sovereignty, if you want to constrain the power of that sovereign, then the sovereign has to consent to it. And this is a great legal system if we could get it for us. Yeah, I'm willing to let you, you know, be a policeman and, and, and enforce any law you want, but I personally have to consent to the law first. And if I don't like the law, I'm not going to comply with it. I mean, that, you know, that would be like anarchy if we took it outside of the, of the international system. But that's the international system. The subjects of the law have to all consent. And you see it at an even great, more granular level. If, the, if a government doesn't like the evolution of custom, they can continue to object to it as to them. So they can defeat the evolution of custom as it applies to them. Because they don't want to give up their, their, their sovereignty. They don't want to consent to it. And they never get subject to that international law rule. One of the, one of the long term examples of that was most of the world was moving towards the right to development as a, as a right. That, that um, peoples had a right of self-determination, uh, people had a right to develop to their full capacity. It was set in different ways, but it was really a developing country post-colonial push in the UN to promote the idea that countries should have the right to self-determination and to determine their own development, and that they had a, not only a state right, but an individual right to development. And the US really didn't like that. Uh, position because they thought it was going to get transformed into like a legal obligation on them to fulfill the right to development. And as a wealthy country, maybe that would mean transfers of wealth or things like that. So the US, whenever that, that comes up and anybody ever said that this was a emerging principle of customary law, the US would drop a footnote, including in the Rio Declaration, and say, we continue to, to believe that this is not an uh, emerging principle and we will not be bound by it, and so on and so forth. And so for decades, the US, we weren't the only country, but we were uh, one of only a few that would continually fight the evolution of custom in this area. And as a result, the State Department could rightly argue that there was no international right to development that applied to them legally. Now, they have moved that position a little bit uh, more recently as the right to development has been reshaped um, to be more clearly not about an obligation for the, for the US or wealthy countries to pay for the development in other countries. Um, but this idea of consent is at the root of international law. And so it becomes at the root of how we form international environmental law. And getting consent is slow, as we know. So let me pause there. Are there any questions about the sources, the generic gen general sources? And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the field itself and, and how we use those sources in the field, where we got going for the field. Any questions? Any answers? Anybody want to dissent from the customary principle that we've done the sources? All right. Um, so the environmental field. How do these sources work for us in the environmental field? Well, the environmental field is not like, the first thing to say is we're not like the human rights field. We don't have, the human rights field started with this great universal declaration that in some ways form the basis of codifying customary law and principles around international law, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And then a whole bunch of very broad treaties. Not a whole bunch, but a few. Two in particular, the um, civil and political rights, economic, social, and cultural rights, and then a variety of treaties along, along the way. But there were these sort of broad principles. We don't really have that. And we also don't have the apparatus, like the, inter, the human rights commissions and tribunals to, to to, to um, enforce those treaties. Um, we also don't have a really big international institution like the World Trade Organization that can kind of uh, administratively um, implement international environmental law. But we do have some things going for us. So what does the field look like? Um, 
Well, we don't have a broad set of principles, of legal principles, but we, our field has been shaped um, first by these massive summits that we hold. Uh, and in particular, um, you know, starting in 1972 with the Stockholm Conference, um, the field was uh, shaped by the idea that we would bring these, the UN together to talk about the different summits, or to, to talk about the environment. And Stockholm, if we start with the Stockholm Conference in 1972, the reason why that was important in the long run, I mean, there was a lot of reasons. It created our institution, UNEP, United Nations Environment Program. But the real, if we look back at it, what Stockholm really did for us was it legitimized environment as a, as a subject for international cooperation. So that seems like a long time ago, but it was just 1972. Prior to that time, it was not clear that when states got together to give up sovereignty or talk about sovereignty, that environment was a reason why they might actually want to give up sovereignty and compromise. Uh, and in 1972, the UN held this, this conference. And one of the things that it did is it legitimized environment as a subject for international cooperation. Um, anybody read the UN Charter recently? Uh, well, you can go back and read it, but now you can just Google it. When you Google it and then you do a search term for the word environment, how many times does the word environment come up? in the UN Charter? I'll give you a hint, it's the same amount that comes up in the US Constitution. Um, zero, zil, null, nil, null, void. So nobody was thinking about the environment when they did the UN Charter in the 1940s. It, it was pre-industrial. We hadn't, uh, or it wasn't pre-industrial, but it was pre our understanding of the in industrial impacts on the environment, which really wouldn't emerge until the 1960s. So if you wonder why it took till 1972 to have an international conference that legitimizes environment, it was because even in the US and in Europe, we weren't thinking about the environment as a major issue until the late 1960s um, or the mid-1960s. And then you have Earth Day and you have all those things happening at the domestic level. Well, at the same time, um, it starts to raise the issues internationally, particularly it's being raised in Europe. Um, we, were, you know, we in the, the US weren't thinking about international issues because most of our were big enough that most of the questions didn't, most of the environmental issues weren't raising transboundary issues. But in Europe, every time somebody sneezes or every time a coal plant sneezes, the pollution goes into another country and they th think international law almost immediately. And the reason why we met in Stockholm was because Stockholm's up north getting all the crap that Germany and the, and, and the rest of Europe are sending that way. And so they want to, you know, they're willing to host the first conference because they want to get some transboundary discussion, particularly about uh, issues like acid rain and things like that that were on the agenda. So that's sort of an important milestone. Um, but in interesting to recognize in, in 1972 that we didn't have the participation at Stockholm was primarily northern uh, and it was also completely seen through the prism of the east-west politics of the Cold War. So you didn't have the, you know, the Soviet Union boycott at the last minute. You only had a couple of countries from the south. You also, interestingly, had very little um, civil society participation. Nobody was there, with the possible exception of Jacob Shear. We'll have to ask him whether Jacob was actually at, at Stockholm. But there were very, I think he might have been, or NRDC might have been. I mean, there, there wasn't much of an environmental movement yet. But there were organizations that had gotten created and Greenpeace and, and, and others in the US and Europe. Um, uh, and some of them were starting to do international work. Um, but we didn't really, so that was sort of you know, the first foray into these summits. And then jump ahead to 1992, where we really get going on these summits. Uh, we held one at the 10th anniversary in 1982, but it, it's kind of obscure. It's um, where we passed the World Charter on Nature, which if you're really interested in it was sort of the progressive high point for international um, diplomacy for saying that nature has an inherent right to be protected, that you know, a biocentric view of the world. That actually, the World Charter on Nature kind of embodies that view, but we pretty much stepped away from that sense. But the big meeting was not until Rio uh, in the Earth Summit in 1992. And now we're far enough along that, um, away from it, that you guys don't remember it or anything like that. But this is a sea change in uh, international environmental law. And it's a sea change that goes right against the traditional view of international law. So if the traditional view of international law is you know, state to state relationship, then the treaty negotiations are quiet affairs between diplo diplomats. Well, in, you know, by 1992, in, the Rio, uh, in, in all environmental summit sense and all environmental negotiation sense, 
that is totally out the door. I mean, these are not quiet affairs. You get 70,000 people going to Lima, uh, or not that many to Lima, but there will be that many in Paris, you know, around the climate negotiations. You have tens of thousands of people showing up at these conferences, uh, and they're not representing states, as, as the general counsel of the bank would say. It's no longer rare for people like this to meet with people like that. They're all over the place in the environmental field. So we've got the sea change, and it really emerged at Rio because of it, it, partly right where it was in the, in the confluence of several different um, things that were happening at that time. I mean, one was the fall of the, of, the, of the Berlin Wall. So you finally had a, uh, the first global summit in which um, countries weren't going to line up depending on where they were in the east-west conflict. Were they a US puppet state or a Soviet puppet state? And that was going to determine you know, what they said in the meetings. This was the first time where we thought maybe we could have an honest conversation. Certainly the first time where we could have an honest conversation about the environment where the, nor where the major fissure point would be north-south instead of east-west, where we could have an honest conversation, all developed countries, all developing countries, and not be seeing who's lining up with who. So that was very important. It gave us a lot of hope and confidence that something different would happen at Rio. The second thing that happened that was different was, um, uh, was the rise of civil society. So you, you, for the first time, had this idea of a global environmental movement. You had, by 1990, unlike 20 years before, you had organizations that were focused on international environmental networking and working together. You had international environmental law groups. So if you look at when these programs got started or these organizations got formed, uh, the Center for International Environmental Law in 1989, Foundation for International Environmental Law and Development in uh, 1989, um, E-Law, the Environmental Law Alliance Worldwide, 1989, the International Program of NWF, about 1986 or 87, it expands. The point is that in the late 80s, you see all the domestic groups starting to get international programs, and you see new groups popping up whose focus is on international law. And that reflecting, and the other thing that's happening is they have relationships with people around the world in developing countries. Now, interestingly to me, looking back at it, that also was done without the internet. And it was done without email. But it was the, it was the beginning of it. I, you know, the, the idea that there was a global movement and people discovering what you guys take for granted, that you have more in common with an environmental or human rights activist from Ecuador or from China or from wherever than you might have with an industrialist or somebody else who's from the US. You have a lot in common that's organized by your interests and your beliefs. You can create networks and you can create advocacy strategies and you can do things globally that nobody could have dreamed of in 1972. Um, and it was all being done by fax. I always tell the story that, um, you remember the fax machine? You guys know what a fax machine is? How many, of you know, how many of you don't know what a fax machine is? Don't be embarrassed. OK, you all know what a fax machine is still. Well, that was the only thing tool we had. And I used to be part of a network of 50 groups around the world that was organizing to reform the World Bank. Same time period, 1991, 92. And we didn't have email. So for me to do a letter that was signed by the 50 groups, I'd have to send out a draft letter. And I'd have to have somebody stand by the machine, type in all of the phone numbers, because also we didn't, couldn't afford a really good machine where you could code it. You know, so they'd be sitting there, they'd type in all the machines you know, with all the right area codes and country codes and everything like that. And then you'd send the fax through and you'd have to make sure, and then you'd get the error message about how many of the 50 people's fax machines were turned off, their phone was busy, they have to, you have to call them separately and say, can you turn your fax on because I'm sending one. It would take somebody all day, literally all day, to fax the letter out. So my assistant would sit there in the fax machine. That would be partly what she'd do that day, she or he. And, and then um, and it would cost $500 in phone bills. You know, because the fax, if it was a five-page letter or something like that. So it was a lot of money. And then that's the draft. They have to send me back their comments. I have to redo it and then send it back out and say, OK, this is the final. Can you sign on or not? You know, no more changes because it's just too expensive. And then you. You know, run ahead to today, international networking today is like a couple of buttons pressed and things like that. That makes a huge difference in how we talk about international environmental law. I mean, I don't, you know, to be honest, in the way I practice international environmental law, the State Department lawyers, those conservative diplomats uh, in the State Department, I'm just using them to, to, to pick on them, um, uh, they're largely irrelevant for a bunch of what's happening on the outside of law development because it's happening so much more, more quickly. And the environmental community is a lot less formal. We're able to work off of 
you know, faxes. We don't need all the, we don't need a, the first half an hour of any diplomatic meeting is thank you for coming and it's so nice to see you and everything. It's like, you know, we don't have time for that. It's like, press a button, do you agree with me or not, or we'll move on. So this, this was transforming the idea of global environmental movement around the time of the Earth Summit. And so that's why you see, you know, taking by surprise the governments that this, this parallel meeting that takes place where 5,000, 10,000 people show up and they want to be a part of the summit. And that just doesn't fit with the idea of traditional international law. What are they doing here? And we're going to do our little declaration and our little thing and they're all, they're making noise. And then you see somebody like the Senator, Al Gore and John Kerry, showing up at Rio and saying, well, we're going to go across the street and go talk to the NGOs. And then you start to see the integration of, of you know, the blurring between what the governments are doing and what the non-governments are doing. And you see that blurring all the way through the summit so that by the time you get to the Johannesburg summit, since the UN doesn't know why they're holding the summit, and we kind of, we kind of, they need something to do, they say, you know what? All those people out there in those tents, let's bring them in and we'll talk about partnerships. And this will become part of our formal process. So, the, um, so we have these summits and we can talk about it. And, and you may want to talk about whether they're valuable or not. But I'll, I'll say a couple of reasons why they're valuable. And there may be a lot of reasons why they're not, these big sustainable development summits. They give us a forum to continue the dialogue about sustainable development, um, to talk about the principles that relate to sustainable development. They give us a forum to keep it on the agenda. Um, uh, and, and in particular, they've given us a forum to keep the dialogue between the North and the South or developed and developing countries. Um, they haven't necessarily really done that much to promote law as law, but they've done a lot to keep the, uh, this, this long-term discussion going about sustainable development in one or more of its different forms, whether we call it green economy or, or something else. But, um, uh, and it's helped us define um, the politics around uh, sustainable development uh, and the polit political setting for the development of international environmental law. Again, no more so than in Rio, the first Rio, where we had the Rio Declaration. Um, that was a bit of a digression for a few minutes. Uh, any questions? Let me pause. So back to the sources. Um, the Rio Declaration, which is why I got onto the summits, because the, the Rio summit was a huge event. Um, we're used to them now, but at the time it was uh, captured the world's attention, the environment captured the world's attention. Um, it mixed for the first time uh, this wide range of civil society actors, global environmental movement. Um, and from a legal perspective, it was also an amazing meeting because it, it um, uh, was the place where the uh, the treaties were announced, the Climate Change Treaty, the Biodiversity Convention. Um, the Desertification Convention is usually viewed as a Rio Treaty because it was, although not signed right then, was signed shortly thereafter. Um, so it had a huge impact on international law. And the reason why it did, it's another reason why the summits are so valuable, is that it gave everybody a date to aim for. So there was a lot of political pressure to make Rio successful, which meant there was a lot of political pressure to finish those treaties in time. And without that political pressure, you might not be able to overcome the sovereignty concerns of the, of the different countries. But they wanted Rio to be a big success. They were all showing up. It was the largest gathering of world leaders in history up to that point in time. They didn't, one thing about world leaders is they don't want to show up at any event and not have something to say. So they don't want to show up, with the possible exception of Obama in Copenhagen. But I'll get to that in a minute. Um, you know, most of the time, if they're going to show up, uh, they have something to say, and, they, and they're not going to show up if you don't have some treaties to sign, some declarations to sign, some good stuff to sort of say, look how much we've worked. So there's a lot of political pressure that builds towards, uh, towards that date. Uh, and that gave us, in addition to, the, to those conventions, it gave us the Rio Declaration. Um, and that still to this day, 20-some years later, uh, still reflects the closest thing we have to a political consensus on principles. Not necessarily on legal principles, but on principles. And does, does anybody know the legal status of the Rio Declaration? It's, it was endorsed by the UN General Assembly. So there was a UN General Assembly vote that said we endorse this. So it's a UN General Assembly resolution. But if we go back to our sources of law, it's not a treaty. It wasn't ratified by any country. It's not custom. It's not state practice plus plus opinion of jurists, is not general principles. Um, 
It's not a legal writing of experts. Uh, it's a political document. And it's a UN General Assembly resolution, which doesn't have uh, legal force by itself. Um, so the most we could say, perhaps, is that it's evidence of some source, sources of law, but it's not itself law. Having said that, the individual principles in there, some of them reflect either what we would now say is customary law or certainly reflect sort of what we fight over, what the emerging principles are. But if we were successful, they would be principles of law not because they're in the Rio Declaration. They would be principles because they met one of those other sources. Um, the Rio Declaration just becomes evidence, if you see what I mean, that uh, maybe of opinio juris or one more argument you put into it. But if you cite the Rio Declaration as, as a principle and you cite Rio Principle 7 and you cite it and then you say, and that's the only citation you use, in the international system, you'll get laughed at as suggesting that the Rio Declaration is law. But then what is it? I mean, 150 countries got together in Rio, more world leaders than ever, and they got together and they signed this document. You read it, it sounds like states shall do this, states shall do that. It sounds like some pretty legalistic language over there. They also negotiated the hell out of it. They took, they took all day long. I always tell the story that I, and I'll tell it very quickly right now, but you know, I, I, um, I uh, had the opportunity two years later to be a rapporteur for the UN, um, and it was, um, it's going to take me a little longer than a little bit. But uh, my, my task was to write, um, the, the meeting was international legal experts who were going to identify principles of law relevant to sustainable development. And so the obvious place to start was the Rio Declaration. And I was writing the background paper, and then they were going to bring in all these State Department diplomats and other people, kind of the head lawyers for all the countries were going to come together. They actually came together at AU to review my draft. Well, when I was doing the draft, I, you know, I, I was smart enough. I was pretty young at the time and uh, a little naive, but I was smart enough to realize, oh, I should start with the Rio Declaration. But the Rio Declaration isn't very good. I mean, you read it and you think, what, the, what, what, what were they smoking when they did this? I mean, it was, you know, I could write a better Rio Declaration than they did. So I did. I wrote a better Rio Declaration. I looked at it. I said, oh, we can change this word here. The first, first, the first uh, article seems like they want to talk about a human right to a healthy environment, but they don't say that. So I'm going to say human right to a healthy environment. And you know, I'm going to change a little bit here and make you know. Then the second principle, which we'll look at in a minute, says you know states have the obligation to um, uh, have the sovereign right to do whatever they want within their own country, but they shouldn't do harm outside their borders. And I'm like, hey, they shouldn't do significant harm inside their border either. That would be a good principle. So you know, I'm like changing the principles all over. And I get to, and I you know and I do this. And so then, and this is my first real time having come into international environmental law as the as the Greenpeace hippie activist, this is the first time where I was sort of had risen to the level, the level of where the diplomats were willing to give me a, an actual diplomatic role. This, you know, they were actually, I was inside the temple of international lawyers and I'm writing the background. I'm very excited about it. We, we gathered them all together. They've got my draft de declaration. And Ambassador Winfred Lang, who'd been the, the lead legal negotiator for Austria and, and the lead chair of the legal committee for the Montreal Protocol, so he's a big diplomat. He's chairing the meeting, and we've got everybody around the, around the room. And he starts off by, you know, well, they always start off by 15 minutes of thanking the person for was doing such a great job in the background paper. You know, thank you, thank you, oh, yes, you know. Uh, and I'm, I'm waiting for the, and then they finally say, okay, now we're ready to take comments on this 30 page set of principles and explanations that I've given that I'm very proud of. And Ambassador Lang starts off by saying, now we're ready to take comments. I suppose the first question we should ask ourselves is should we start with the draft principles text that Professor Hunter in his wisdom, I think he was nice enough to call me professor at the time, Professor Hunter in his infinite wisdom has given us, or should we start with the real declaration principles that most of us spent 24 hours a day for seven, seven days a week negotiating just two years ago at Rio? Should we start with his or ours? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sinking as low as I possibly could in the meeting. But the point of that was, of course, that, and the point he was making was that the Rio Declaration was accepted by 150 governments. And we, shouldn't, we can't just so quickly toss it out because we don't think it's strong enough, which it's not. It was, it was, a, it was the um, root of a political compromise. And uh, so we have to accept it and read it that way. Um, this is what they could get governments to agree. But there's a flip side of that, too. I shouldn't say, incidentally, that they did start with my text. I just got to say that. They did, they did it eventually, after, after arguing about it for a little while and making sure that I understood what I'd done, they then went on and said, well, we can use his text. But, but the point of that story is also that 
There's a flip side to that. If the text matters so much, then it should matter to those states. They shouldn't get away with saying, oh, it's a soft law document. And, and they can't get away with it as long as those 5,000 people at Rio or those 50,000 people in, at Copenhagen or however many show up to, to Lima or Paris, if they just keep reminding them or whoever goes up to the UN to protest, is that what I heard somebody say? That? There's a little action going on up there. You know, uh, part of it is that what were the governments doing? Did they have their hand behind their back and their fingers crossed and say, we're going to sign the document, but by the way, by the way, it's soft law. You know, it doesn't mean anything. And so by the time we walk out of Rio, we can just forget it. Well, they'll forget it if we let them forget it, or if we let them control the, the um, dialogue about what law is to just those formal sources that they control. So the answer is no, it's international law. They signed it. Those principles should mean something. And, and I'll use the analogy again. If I'm in front of the World Court of Justice, I'm not going to cite the Rio Declaration. But if I'm in front of the New York Times, I'm going to say, how dare the US backtrack on principle seven of the Rio Declaration? It's 20 years. Every government in the world endorsed it. Well, what, what do they mean it's not binding? I don't care if it's binding or not. They should comply with it. And it, it, it leaves it up to the, the unwashed, non-traditional actors to push forward the idea of compliance with this so-called soft law. Because what does it mean? To, what does it actually mean if it's binding or not binding? It's, it's what we make of it that makes it binding or not binding. If we embarrass them. And I have seen more than one time, many times, um, where a country has come into a negotiation and said, taken a hard position on something, and some other country has said, you can't, you know, the Rio Declaration says this. Why don't we just start from that point? And they'll say, no, 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 no. no. So, but, but that's the Rio Declaration. You've got to start from there. Otherwise, you're backpedaling on Rio. What were you doing down there? Summit. And governments do this to one another. And NGOs and civil society are able to do it through the use of press. And so that's why the principles take on a certain role. And some of the principles have been uh, used better that way. Um, uh, but that's why it's still a document that kind of gives us the contours of where um, law is uh, and where the principles are. So we don't have a lot of principles, customary principles, but we do have these political principles that shape domestic law that sometimes we can use in a kind of a harder way. Um, uh, but, uh, but we don't have a set of binding international environmental principles. And, you know, I am... Um, I used to argue for a set of binding. I used to, as part of that process that I was just describing, uh, identification of legal principles, I used to be pushing for uh, codifying something like the Universal Declaration in, in human rights, a universal binding set of principles for international environmental law. I mean, we should have something that we can, we can do. And the government lawyers in the US would always tell me, Hunter, don't push for it because you won't like the outcome. You know, you, you, you can push for it, but the politics won't allow you to get a document that you'll think is strong enough. So you're better off pushing through the soft law. And you can see that, and we'll come back to this. You can kind of see this in the, in the negotiations over climate change. I mean, it, it, you know, if we really want to fall on our sword on something that's binding, we might have to give up some of the substance of strength. And so then you really have to ask the question, what's the difference between what's the practical difference between something that's binding and therefore enforceable under traditional law and something that's non-binding and only enforceable by non-traditional means. And I, for one, am moving more and more into the side where I'm more than willing to take voluntary pledges and then you know, do a jujitsu on them later and say, yeah, well, you're going to violate your voluntary pledge. You know, that's still horrible. I don't know what the sanctions are, but except embarrassing. But um, naming and shaming is all, almost all we have anyways uh, for enforcement. So, um, so the Rio Declaration gives us those principles. Um, I'm going to, uh, I may not have enough for everybody, but this is just excerpts from um, the chapter of the book. Um, it has a couple of the principles, which I'll substantively talk about in a minute. Um, you can take them or share them. I think I only made like 30 of them or something. I tried to save a tree. Um, but it also has um, to go to the other source of international environmental law that's really important in our field, which is treaties. And one thing that we have that most other fields are very jealous about is that we have a tremendous number of, well, not a tremendous, but we have a tremendous number. We have four or 500 treaties. But global treaties, we have more than a dozen, 14, 15 global environmental treaties, treaty regimes that are, and this is the, the interesting thing, that are almost universally accepted. So we have, so our, our participation in our treaties is 
tremendous. Uh, I mean, by participation, I mean most governments uh, have ratified most of the environmental treaties. And you look at the numbers, I mean, Convention on Biological Diversity, 193. The Montreal Protocol, 197. By the way, that was every country. They were the first treaty to have been ratified by every country on the planet at the time, at one point in time. I think there's now a new state, maybe South Sudan, that hasn't gotten around to ratifying it. But, um, but you look at these numbers, they're all way up over 150, 160 parties to the conventions. That's a remarkable achievement to get that kind of consensus for things. Now, it should suggest a couple of things about the treaties. Maybe we get that much consensus, maybe because there's something in it for everybody, or maybe it's because it's not too binding. I mean, you know, it's not really constraining if we go back to the power of state sovereignty. Maybe they're willing to comply because, or ratify, because the sanctions aren't too great or the, or the um, obligations are. That would be one theory. Another theory would be that it's good for everybody or that they've got great global commitment to the underlying goal that we're trying to do. And I think it's a combination of all those things. But when we look at our field, we should start by feeling pretty good about the broad participation we have. Now, having said that, there is a, often a missing participant in many of the treaties. Anybody know who that is? Yeah, just a little insignificant problem that about half of these treaties, um, the US is not a party. So we're not a party to the Convention on Biological Diversity, which means we're not uh, qualified to be a party to the Cartagena Protocol. Um, we are to CITES. We're not to the Convention on Migratory Species, although in fairness, that was mostly a European and North African convention that's just been going global recently. But the US has resisted. I think, I think we're still not a party to Basel, um, though there's been a lot of proposals that we would be. We are to Montreal. We are to the UN Framework Convention on Climate. Not to Kyoto, of course, very famously. Uh, the CCD, we are. Ramsar, we are. UNESCO, we are. Law of the Sea, we're not. And then the um, chemical conventions, the other chemical conventions, um, not Stockholm yet. But interestingly, Minimata Mercury Convention, which was just negotiated two years ago, we were the first country to ratify it. Um, and the reason for that was because of what, you know, we, were, we shaped it in many, many different ways, and there was nothing that was going to require any change in US domestic law, so we could, we could sign it as a, uh, commit to it as an executive agreement, actually. Um, so our record at, at in the US of ratifying is not great, to say the least. But the rest of the world has ratified. And it's created a tremendous field of international environmental law. But there is something different between principles and treaties. And I, I just want to say, I mean, it, it suggests something about our field from a legal perspective, which is that we deal with the environment. We, we manage complex environmental issues through compromise. And so um, we're comfortable with creating big bureaucratic regimes and the regimes are important. They're, they're, um, you know, when, they, when the Conference of the Parties meets in Lima, Peru this fall and 30,000 of our closest friends will be there, that's an important way of raising the consciousness about climate change. It's an important time for people to get together and share expertise. There's a lot of important things that happen regardless of whether we get an agreement or not, which is a good thing since we so rarely get an agreement. But, um, these regimes have a very important life of managing these issues over time. And that's a different approach than you see in human rights uh, or a rights-based approach to the environment where you know, we don't tend to think about comp you know, managing our human rights. We get our human right or we don't get our human right. We don't compromise our human rights. And so the same with principles. And I think one of the reasons why the governments don't want to go to broad principles is they're more comfortable talking about managing the complexities of specific things and it's certainly true why um, they, they have some difficulty with really operationalizing a human right to a healthy environment, even though more and more governments are, are adopting one. Um, so as we look at sources, this is where we really have our sources. We don't have, um, for example, very many um, principles. And we also, as a result, don't have or both as a result and as a cause, we don't have that many cases. We don't have that much case law, which is also one of the um, sources of law, one of the uh, uh, publicists, one of the writings that can be influential, if you look at Article 38J, is um, uh, our 
previous cases. So if we had a lot of ICJ cases on the environment, we could develop a lot of international environmental law principles. We could develop customary law. But we don't have a lot of cases. Um, we have had about six or seven. We've got a new one since last year that's pretty interesting on whaling. Um, but you, know, you can name that handful of at least cases in the ICJ. We get a lot of cases in the law of the sea. But because of that, we haven't developed um, a lot of knowledge about what principles mean or what they're, what, what they, uh, how they would be applied in cases because countries just don't bring cases. Um, and so we've had six. We've had one. Uh, you can, we can almost name all of them, I think, off the top of my head. We've got uh, Gapchikovo, uh, the case in, between Hungary and Slovakia involving a dam. You'll see a trend, trend there. We've got um, uh, a legal opinion that was pushed by NGOs, um, a legal advisory opinion on the legality of nuclear weapons. Uh, and the ICJ um, has jurisdiction over advisory opinions if an international organization or a government asks them for an advisory opinion. In that case, the World Health Organization asked about the legality of use, the use of nuclear weapons. And we got some environmental language out of that. Um, there was a case involving um, uh, the Uruguay pulp mills case, um, coal fire power plant. There's the whaling case. Um, there's been a transboundary case between Colombia and Ecuador involving the um, uh, use of pesticides in, to, to kill uh, poppies and other um, drugs um, that raise some. There's a case involving Nicaragua over water. There's a, a number of water cases. There's a recent one between India and Pakistan in the International Court of Arbitration. So a lot of uh, development cases around water, but the, the law that they apply is often a little bit more about development, a little less about the environment. The point is that we don't have a lot of cases. Why don't we have a lot of cases? I mean, you know, look at the US. We've got environmental cases all the time going on in the US. Why don't we have international cases? We're going to take a break after you answer this question. But I'm not going to give you the answer. You've got to figure it out yourself. Why don't we have a lot of cases? There's not a lot of binding law to base anything off of? Well, that doesn't explain, well, it does partly explain why the cases aren't brought. Because nobody's quite sure how they'll come out. So you have a lack of confidence. Nobody wants to bring a case and lose. So the uncertainty is part of the reflection. But why else? Yeah, exactly. And the corollary of that. Yeah, if, if, oh, if you couldn't hear, yeah. The um, um, states tend to negotiate with one another when it comes to environmental issues. Again, complex negotiations as opposed to wanting to bring litigation. And the corollary aspect of that is who can bring a case in international court? Who can? States. states. Who else can? Mm, states. Um, who else can? Mm, states. Conservative State Department lawyers. Can bring, state, can bring cases against other states, but nobody else can. I can't bring a case in the International Court of Justice on behalf of the indigenous communities that are being affected by a transboundary impact or about any impact. Um, uh, only states have jurisdictions in front of states or international organizations in some circumstances. So if we're looking for motivation to bring cases, you've first got to convince a, a state that they want to take an adversarial position against another state in a court where the law is uncertain uh, and the complexity of the issue is that they, what they really may want is help in managing the issue. So you don't see a lot of cases. And in fact, even the Argentine-Uruguay case, I love this example because um, the way that that case got brought was that there were a whole bunch of civil disobedience protests. So Argentina, the, the pulp mills were being built on the Uruguay side. And, um, but it was affecting people in Argentina. So they started protesting. Um, and and they, uh, they, want, they couldn't bring an action in Uruguay because they didn't have standing because they weren't Uruguayan citizens. And they couldn't bring the action in Argentina because they couldn't get the pulp mill company as a defendant in Argentina. So they, they had no litigation strategy. So they just started filling the bridges up for like six months. Anybody from Argentina or Uruguay remember this aspect happening? So th they created this huge you know, sort of momentum in Argentina. Um, and uh, some of the... Uh, human rights lawyers who were representing them were trying to bring the cases. They, they brought an action. It's not really a case in, into the IFC, into the World Bank Group, and they did some other things. But they built up political pressure. So, so much political pressure that the president of Argentina had a problem 
Uh, he didn't want to bring the case against Uruguay. First off, he didn't have any environmental lawyers in his cabinet or in his, uh, on his employment. Uh, so he didn't know how he was going to bring the case. And secondly, he didn't want to have that relationship with Uruguay. It wasn't important enough. I mean, he has a lot of other important things like economics and trade and finance. Why would he want to bring in a thing about a couple of stupid little pulp mills? But that province was really important. And he had a governor in that province who was starting to make a lot of noise about running against him. And so he had to do something for it. So he announced the case. But it was completely driven by domestic political unrest that drove Argentina to say, OK, we're going to bring the case. Then, ironically enough, they looked around and said, we want to bring the case. We don't have any lawyers in Argentina in the government that knows anything about international environmental law. So they went and hired the lawyer who was representing the, um, uh, the, the people. Um, her name was Romina Piccolotti, and said, why don't you come and become my environment minister? And by the way, since you're the one barking about us taking this case, you get to lead the team to bring the case because we have nobody else. And so she became the environment minister in order to handle the case. But the pressure, you know, the exception kind of proves the rule. The reason why we don't have any many cases is that it's, it's not in any state's best interest unless you really make the political pressure pay on it. Um, and then you can build the pressure. And really, you could say the same story about uh, the Hungary-Slovakia case. The governments were very reluctant to bring it, but then you had the government change. Um, and all the protesters were inside the government, and suddenly they could bring the case. So it's a big problem for us, again, blocked by the traditional role of the state to progress international law. And states don't want to do it not only because they want to negotiate, but they also, you know, there may be a downstream state this time, but an upstream state next time. They don't, want to, they don't actually want the law to be that clear because they're going to have to pay out sometimes and pay in. I think, I think governments are kind of happy with the law being kind of obscure and a guesswork. Um, OK, we're going to take a break for five minutes, 10 minutes. How much time? How much time do you need to like run to the restroom and stretch? 10 minutes, we'll say. I'm going to uh, step back for a minute and talk a little differently about the difference between hard and soft law. So hard law, we've been talking about. It's the sources of binding law. So, um, and soft law is everything else, kind of. So I want to talk about um, the characteristics of hard law, why we put such an emphasis on it. When we think about it, we put a lot of emphasis on it. A lot of the discussion, if you follow the climate negotiations, are will it be a binding treaty? Won't it be a binding treaty? Will it be a binding agreement? Or will it be an agreement of legal consequence, or whatever the language is that they use? I mean, they, they negotiate um, whether, they're, whether they're going to negotiate a binding treaty or not. They negotiate the terms of reference for negotiation. And they talk about whether it's going to be hard law or soft law. And a lot of act activism goes into trying to make sure that these things are, are in a treaty that are that is enforceable. So um, when we think about the difference between hard law, why is it that people want things to be hard law? What, what's, the, what's, the, what's the characteristic of hard law? Now, the characteristic on one level is does it fit into one of those topics? So that's a very formalistic, but that's the traditional way of looking at it. If it fits into one of those topics, it's hard law. But why do we want to fit it into the, to one of those topics? Why do we want to have something that we call hard law? What's the quality of it? the qualities of it that we want. It's enforceable. it's enforceable. What do you mean by being enforceable? I mean, there's something laid out that if you, do, if you don't do what it says, then it's So if you don't, so there's a sanction. There's a, there's a hardness to it. I come back to the same thing, but an enforceability to it. Yeah, so, so if, there, if, if, if countries are willing to be bound by it, it, it heightens the importance of it, the, the way we talk about it. I think, I think that's true. It, it makes it seem more important. Um, uh, and, and, and we expect to have some sanction by it. Um, what else? Yeah, how does it create change? What's the, what, what, how does the creature? It encourages people to act a certain way, I guess. But how? As opposed to by hard versus soft law. By, by what? By punishing them. By punishing them, by having a sanction, by enforcement. So it forces, it forces change um, against their will. It constrains because of this, this sanctioning power. It also can be a case law 
Yeah, so you might be able to have some mechanisms that will build a, a, a set of, um, uh, clarify the rules if, if you keep referring back to the, to the rules. I and mean, we want to have a rule-based system at, at any rate so we can create um, a, set of, a set of rules that we, that we live by. Um, but, but how does that relate to whether it's hard or soft? Could, or could you imagine a way to create an, an understanding of the rules if it wasn't an, if, as hard? I don't know. I have to think about that myself a little bit. You might be able to. What, what else? So, 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 so think about it in the difference. When, we, when people say, when you think hard versus soft law, what do you think the differences are? What, what do you think about? Yeah. Well, hard laws have to be, I mean, not necessarily, but like a treaty has to be ratified, whereas like a resolution just has to be like signed by like whatever delegate is present. Right. So the, 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 formal, the formal part of hard law, like ratification, is that signal that something is now going, we're now going to be bound by it, as opposed to a declaration, which could just be a vote or a signature of the president. Um, and so formally, we recognize when a country has agreed to be to admit to enforcement, uh, and I think it has some. It's signaling something else. They take it important. There might be sanctions available to it. They're going to live under this regime. So it does have some signaling impact. What else? It shows that people are in agreement about something specific. Whereas soft law, some people might not agree with it, and therefore ignore it. But a thing about binding shows that everybody. Well, if well, let me test that for a minute. If um, let's just um, is it the is it does that speak to the number of countries that have agreed to it or the form that they've agreed to it in? So, for example, if if 180 countries agreed to the Rio Declaration, everyone agreed to it, and only 50 agreed to the Binding Convention, how, how, what does that mean for you? Did I just unravel you? So the hard soft. We don't want to build too much. That's OK. I'm going to unravel a lot of this in a minute, I think. Yeah? I you kind of soft law powers. Um, I guess my best example was the kind of banking Olympics, where all the other nations didn't want to go to China because it was a second issue. So um, China, it was sort of soft power uh, peer pressure to get China to start lowering their emissions so that they could, um, so that other nations yeah, so we can talk about, as we talk about soft power or sanctions, so a lot of what we've been talking about, the difference between hard law and soft law, uh, some, of it, some of the signaling and stuff I think is an interesting way, but a lot of it we're talking about the signaling and the, the, the deepness, if not the breadth of the acceptance, the de depth of it is that if they're willing to be bound by it, there's something deeper to it. Um, and that kind of goes to the heart of what we, what we would expect to see, that there would be some kind of sanction. Um, and, but then maybe on the soft side, there would be some kind of other softer pressure or power to go. So for us to understand in international law the difference between hard and soft law, I think we have to unpack this kind of sanctions a little bit. And so what are, you know, this is one of the challenges for international environmental lawyers and for traditionals. Does anybody know what the sanctions are for international environmental law when you, when you violate one of the treaties or if, if, we're, if, if, if one of the crux characteristics of hard law, and putting aside the form of it, I'll come back to the form of it in a minute. The form of it is the formal answer. What is hard law? It's those four categories. But why do we care about it? It's because we think it's got some greater enforceability characteristic to it, that it'll give us some sanction. And because of the sanction, it, it, it creates a deeper commitment. It creates a higher profile. And it creates a, a regime that we can build around. Um, so that must mean that, that, so what does it mean to have something that's enforceable? We have to have sanction. What else do we have to have? And does anybody know what the sanctions are in international environmental law? Yeah. To answer the first question. Yeah. Before that, um, how does it have consequences? Or, yeah, some kind of consequence. Like some kind of consequence um, to have enforceable laws. Yeah. So, but do you I, have any idea what the consequences are? There's no reason why you should know this in international environmental <laughs> law. Yeah, I should. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, there's fines, and sometimes if uh, you know you break a law, you'd have to have like ginormous fines. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you have to do something to apologize, whether it's uh, 
um, to do something specifically to that country that, I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't really know specific, like what specifically yeah. There's it a reason be, why but... you don't know specifically, because it's really hard to point to what we have. As, yeah. I mean, but we'll get to it. I mean, so, you know, fines, we don't tend to fine internationally. Domestically, we can think about enforcement, and we think automatically what the sanctions are. You get thrown in jail, you get uh, a fine, um, look at what happened to BP and the oil spill. Now that they're subject to a bigger set of fines because of the of gross negligence finding here a week or so ago. We're used to that kind of enforcement. And so when we think about binding law, we think, yeah, we're going to have that kind of enforcement. But then you run into the problems of international law. And when you unpack what our, what our ability to, what our sanctions are in practice, we find that even in the binding conventions, we don't have that robust a set of sanctions. So the hard law by form that we all want so much, the treaty, if we unpack it, there's a couple things we need for it to actually be meaningful that it's hard law. Not just that it's a treaty. It's got to have some clear things that, clear standards that can be right or wrong. And I'll tell you, go read the Convention on Biological Diversity. Everybody says the Convention on Biological Diversity is hard law. Every international lawyer will tell you that. Um, but go try to read it and tell me what a country has to do that you could enforce against them. It's, it's, it's all generic cooperation. I shall on a Monday if I feel like it and I've got enough resources kind of think about maybe protecting some biodiversity. There's nothing a lawyer could actually enforce in there, but yet we call that hard law and we like praise it as hard law, but there's nothing in it that is actually clear, committed um, commitment. And if you ask me, as one example, would I want to have a hard treaty that has a bunch of broad pablum in it or a set of voluntary public commitments that are clear and then yes or no commitments? I'm not so sure which I want. So as we unpack the hard versus soft distinction, I want you to start thinking about what does it mean to actually live up to the promise of a hard binding bit of law of a treaty? It means a clear commitment. It means some kind of clear sanction. So the commitments aren't always there, which is um, the Biodiversity Convention is about a lot of cooperation and about prioritizing biodiversity convention conservation, but it doesn't really require governments to do anything specifically. Or, and it doesn't have a lot of sanctions on it. I mean, you can quibble about it, but it's, it's really hard to think about how you'd bring an enforcement action so there's no enforcement action against it. Um, there's, I don't know, it's just like from what you're saying, it sounds like to me, um, oh, really? Um, <laughs> that um, it would make more sense to use soft law because then you're going in agreement with each other. So in international law, if you're using hard law or trying to create these like very specific hard laws, you're not necessarily having like a conversation or more of, um, I don't know, cooperation with another state. Is that true? Or yeah, that I think that's somewhat true. I mean, one thing, I, I, don't, I don't really want you to favor one over the other. But I don't want you to favor one over the other. So that means everybody instinctively wants to favor hard law because they think the binding tree. So I want us to unpack the idea. And one of the things once you start unpacking it is you recognize the formal categories mean less than other things. Like, are they making clear commitments? Are they setting up a nice institutional structure for continuing to talk? Are, they, uh, are there sanctions of some sort? So when you get to sanctions, as, as something that we think is part of hard law. It's not, in other words, it's not the traditional lawyers look at the form and they say it's hard law if we meet one of these forms and it's soft law if we don't. And I want you to look at it as a continuum. The Biodiversity Convention is a hard law treaty, but first off, people don't know what's in it. And secondly, the commitments aren't very great. So I would move that somewhere towards the softer side of hard law. And, and if I compare that to the Rio Declaration, which we've had for 20 years and it has some principles, it's clearly a soft law document. So it would be on this side of the hard law, soft law um, line if we drew the line like this. But there are principles within Rio that are very clear, uh, tell countries what they're supposed to do. And a lot of people have worked around time to hold governments to it. So for me, some of those principles have moved along the continuum, if we think of it as a continuum, towards a harder thing. And that, that's what I really want us to think about, is not think about hard law, soft law as this bright line between did we ratify it or didn't we, um, but as a process of holding governments to account for the promises and commitments they make, no matter what the form they made it in. If they're going to stand up and take a photo opportunity at the Rio Declaration, put their arms around each other and say, look at what us, we're great, and we're committing ourselves to these principles of the Rio Declaration, then I don't want to let them get away with it by saying it was a soft law document. 
And if they're going to get, and if they're going to sign this pablum of the biodiversity convention and say, but we got to, you know, we're giving up all the teeth, but we're going to make it a binding treaty, I don't want to make that trade off necessarily. I think we have to be smarter about it and recognize that the processes of enforcement are broader than just what lawyers do. That we can enforce a law uh, or a treaty or a Rio declaration or a soft law document by what we do with it from the outside. We can make it harder. I always say that we've got people from different countries here. We could do a declaration of principles of climate change negotiations and we could wave it around in, the, in New York in a couple weeks. And actually, it's, it's clearly soft law, right? But if we worked it in the international system, we could move it from if this is the softest of soft law over here and this is the hardest of hard law over here, um, we could move that document and its principles from soft to harder. We would get governments to commit to it through active lobbying, through argument, through getting them to adopt in different ways. We can actually move principles along this continuum. Uh, and it's not just, I mean, we have to understand the, this bright line between hard and soft. But that's just a formulaic line. And there are conventions that I would put way over on the soft law side. And there are soft law declarations that I would put way over on the hard law side because governments have shown more commitment to it. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Well, the Copenhagen Accord. Everybody hated the Copenhagen Accord because it was non-binding. On the other hand, and we'll come back to it in a minute, it did have some clear commitments. In my view, is pivot. Don't let them get away with it by saying it's not binding. Now they made the commitment to it, and you see what's happening. You, you know, the US, when they come out with their annual report, it's held up in the press as whether they're going to comply with their Copenhagen commitments or not. Now, there's no international sanction, but what was the international sanction under international environmental law anyways? And I'll get, now I'll come back to the sanctions, which I haven't answered yet. We have a problem in international environmental law. We, we don't really have a taxing authority internationally. You don't see a lot of international fines on countries, except in one area. Well, maybe a currency too, but particularly trade. You know, what's the sanction in trade? Trade is a robust, strong, internationally enforceable regime. And what do you do to, to a country that's violated their trade agreements with you? Does anybody know what the remedy is, what the sanction is? You what? Yeah, you get, to, you get to impose trade measures on them. And so there's a reciprocal uh, sanction to them. If, you, if you're going to... Uh, uh, violate the trade agreements to some of our products, then we get to put a tax or a tariff on some of your products. Uh, in roughly the same amount of money as you're costing our economy, we're going to cost your economy. And we're permitted to do that. The sanction in a trade, a trade sanction, is that we get to violate the trade treaty too. Now, what's the problem with that for the environment? I got a good idea. If you pollute more, we get to pollute more. Oh, yeah, well, I'll pollute more. Oh, well, that's great. That's a great reciprocal trade sanction. So we can't use the same sanction. We can't use the you know, sort of anti-environmental sanction or the, whatever that would be. The, the, so that's not on the table for us. So then we actually look and we say, well, maybe we can use trade sanctions. In other words, if you don't comply with the environmental provisions, then we'll harm your economy some way. The problem is the governments really don't want to do that. And so when you look at the conventions that we have, and we fight over whether they're hard law or not, they're not, um, the sanctions are, are pretty much, uh, with some exceptions, the, the, we can't really put trade sanctions on, and we don't really have a tool of, of, a, a tool of sanctions at, at our disposal. So we're down to naming and shaming. That's one that we always have. You're in violation of the convention. And I'll grant you, it's stronger if you say you violated hard law. But that's a matter of degree, not a matter of kind. I mean, it's also very strong to say you're continuing to violate your promises at the Rio Declaration. It's the same process. We get the governments and other states to say it, um, and, and, and we work it. So that the, the type of enforcement. Now, the other type of sanction we have is what we call a regime sanction, which is that if you violate the treaty, you don't get some benefit under the treaty. And that's an important one in the environment. And, um, but we can also build that into the soft law documents as well. And the way that that goes is something like this. If you're in violation, the Montreal Protocol is the classic example. Countries that were found to be not meeting compliance with the Montreal Protocol and the phase out of the, of the dates for ozone depletion. So it, it could have been the same under the Kyoto Protocol, but let's use Montreal. The first thing that happens is if they didn't meet their standards. So the Montreal Protocol is binding. It's got really clear standards. You will phase out a chemical by this year. So it's got what we want. It's got clear commitments. It's got a clear timeline. Um, and it's got, and then the question is, what are the sanctions? 
Well, there again, we can't really, we don't really have the authority to just find them. And the countries don't like that. But we could, what we could say is, come before us and um, tell us why you're in non-compliance. Now, the thing about environmental compliance is, again, we go back to that complex management, uh, managing a complex issue. We don't want to just say you're in compliance or not in compliance. We say, we do this domestically, too. We don't actually go to fines uh, that quickly in domestic law. We usually go to fix the problem. We, you know, fines don't help us fix the environment. So if you're a country out of non-compliance with an environmental standard, then we say to you, why don't you fix it? And if you're a developing country, you're going to say, we can't fix it. We don't have the technology. We don't have the resources. We don't have the capacity. And we have different priorities. And so the recipe in an environmental law, including in all those binding treaties that we like so much, is, well, OK, that's all right. We'll pay for it. We'll, we'll let you use the financial mechanism to pay for the, your transition. Because the big important thing is if you're willing to transition, we'll help you transition. Because we recognize that developing countries in particular have other priorities. So the sanction regime is a really soft, some of you soft power, it's a soft sanction regime in most of international environmental agreements, where what you don't, if you don't comply, then you don't get access to money to help you comply. And, and the idea is that most countries will comply and this is actually true. Most countries will comply most of the time if they can. So it's working. It's, it, and also, with most environmental issues, we don't have to get 100% compliance. We've got to get 95% compliance or 97% compliance. We could solve a lot of problems if we could get 97% of the countries to do whatever. And that's the case with the Montreal Protocol. We've got 98% compliance. It's high enough to start improving the ozone layer. So we work this facilitative sanctioning. But it looks a lot less like you know, punishing them, or what we think of as enforcement. It's really a soft law power. Um, and so once you realize that, this bright line between hard law and soft law begins to blur even more. It's like, well, can't we build the kind of soft sanctions or soft um, facilitative approach? We call it the facilitative approach to compliance. And the ultimate thing is if people don't comply, that we offer them money and they still don't meet their, their timelines or things like that, then we just denounce them. Maybe we kick them out of the regime. Maybe we announce that they're in non-compliance and, and they can't trade the environmental product, like ozone-depleting substance or whatever, with, with parties. We treat them like a non-party. But the sanctions are pretty minor. So when we think about all this effort that's put into, is it a hard law or soft law, we have to recognize that even if we win the hard law, our sanctions aren't that great. So we, we want to think about this more in a, in a, in a continuum. Yeah, and they're self-reporting anyway. So most of the conventions are um, based on uh, reporting. Because again, if you think about sovereignty, if you're going to have, it would be nice, and there are proposals that have been under the climate regime and otherwise, that we would send in investigative teams, like we do in some of the harder areas, like arms control and stuff like that, where you actually have a little bit more robust sanctions. So we could imagine a more robust sanctioning and a more robust monitoring and investigation team. It's just that or um, approach. It's just that that's not really that. We don't have a lot of practice of that yet in the environment. So, so um, and countries don't seem to want to do it. So even though they're taking the form of hard law, they're not building with it robust monitoring, investigation, review. A lot of it is on self-reporting. Um, and there's not a lot of cases brought for for enforcement. In fact, the first real case brought to enforce a regime um, was probably the whaling case, in which Japan flouted the, the rules of the International Whaling Commission for years. And finally, Australia and New Zealand decided to see if they could win in a case uh, underneath the Whaling Con Convention. And they did. Um, so we could imagine a stronger system. But it doesn't really fit with the environment. And, and actually, it doesn't fit with domestic. I mean, the, the crux of our domestic enforcement in the United States is also self-reporting. And the only difference is that if you self-report and you lie in the United States, that's when you go to jail for an environmental issue. That's the only time you go to a jail. You lie on your reporting form. But it's still based on self-reporting. And so we use the same kind of reporting for the, for the treaties as well. And we could use the same kind of reporting for, for soft law. We can build a system. And that's, what, and that's, by the way, what's happening under the Copenhagen Accord and under the decisions subsequently in the UN, is that they're building a, soft, a softer set of monitoring, reporting, and verification to go with a softer set of commitments. But it's not dramatically different than we see in what would be a binding regime. 
I just had a question. Is traffic considered an investigative reporting team out of CITES? Uh, yeah, although uh, traffic is under CITES, but um, I don't think they're a part of CITES. Are they? No, they're an NGO. They're an NGO. They're WWF, which is, which is, but it's a great example. Yeah. Traffic is a great investigative reporting enforcement thing. They're not even part of the formal uh, hired sanction. They're, they're what the NGOs do to enforce CITES. So you could imagine that CITES was a soft law document, or a document, it's not, it's a hard law document and it has very clear um, aspects to it. Although even um, CITES is a mature regime, it's got really interesting enforcement potentials, but the best of enforcement that goes on, goes on by outside monitors, outside the system, and then they bring it to the system and they basically embarrass and get the parties to endorse their findings. Um, Mm -hmm. um, what do we do for a country, say, like China, who refuses to allow um, uh, an international group to come in and monitor? Yeah. Um, so um, the first thing to recognize is that under most of the international environmental regimes, again, not arms control, we don't have that power anyway. So we're asking for a power to come in and monitor and second guess the self-reporting that we don't, but this is my point, you don't get it just because the treaty is a hard law treaty. You get it because you negotiated it as part of the hard law treaty. And so we call all these things hard law and we think our work is done. Our work is not done. We need some robustness. Now what's interesting about MRV is that they're negotiating it under the accord, which is a set of soft law commitments. So that proves my point in a way that we have to keep a track less on this formalistic approach and more on building the aspects of what makes a commitment clear, timetable, and then some means of enforcement. And if that means empowering a traffic and allowing the reports to come into the formal thing, then we should do it. If the sanctions, um, you know, in CITES, the sanctions are, are often trade related because it's the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. So the sanction is actually a trade sanction about other wildlife treaty, you know, fish products or things like that. Um, uh, th by the way, the use of trade measures as an enforcement technique for environment can run afoul of the WTO and trade rules. So that's one of the reasons why we backed off. But the other, the real reason is that trade ministries and finance ministries don't want to use their trade and the economic power to support environmental protection. If they did, we'd have a lot stronger domestic regimes, we'd have a lot stronger international regimes. Um, but getting to this point about MRV, um, so it's not, it's, it's not just China. By the way, the US isn't all that keen to have uh, countries coming in and investigating our coal-fired power plants and stuff either. But what's fascinating about that discussion, if you follow it closely enough, is that, so what has happened is that you've got the Copenhagen Accord with voluntary commitments from developing countries and from the US. And, and others, um, and then if you want to have that international finance, if you want technology transfer or finance to support your compliance with your voluntary commitment, then we're going to attach some international MRV to it. So that's a different bit of leverage, and even though it's all soft law, the, the, the little harder mo monitoring comes in because you've asked for international cooperation. So the quid pro quo is not that we've taken a binding commitment, it's that you want the financial support, and with the financial support comes a little international oversight. All in a non-binding non regime. Or it's a little bit fuzzy, but, um, but it could be in a non-binding regime. And so the point is, is that we, we have to think about hard law, soft law, much more nuanced, and in this continuum. And also, the other thing that, that this leads us to understand is that groups like traffic, or people in the street in New York, or um, you know, me and my inspection panel at the World Bank, or things like that, the, the role of enforcement becomes a much, it doesn't just become what a state does to another state, it becomes what we do. And if the, if the brunt power, if the most, at the core, within international environmental regimes is naming and shaming. That's the core of, in most of the regimes. You embarrass them by being isolated. If that's the core, we can do that just as easily around the Rio Declaration or around a soft law document. We just shouldn't let them get away with it. I come back to that. Don't let them hide behind this idea that it's not hard law, and there's, so therefore we're not bound to it. Whatever they commit to in Paris, whether they do it in a treaty or not, we should build up as much as we can on the outside of naming and shaming power, because that's actually the same sanction we would pretty much have anyways. I mean, look at what Canada did in the protocol. 
in the Kyoto Protocol, just as an aside, but it shows you the weakness. Here's the Kyoto Protocol. Its major sanction was that it would penalize you in the second round of commitments. That was, it was a very innovative sanction. So if you violated the Kyoto Protocol and you omitted too much, then when you took your second commitment, they would, they would um, whatever your commitment was, they would cut it down by how much, by one and a half times however much you missed your first commitment re reporting period. So if you, if you emitted too much CO2, the sanction was your target in the second committing period would be uh, lower than it otherwise would be. So they would penalize you there. It was a, actually a pretty innovative and good way to do it, assuming that you had a regime that lived on. Canada just pulled out of the regime before anybody could point at the sanctions and never committed to a second reporting period. So they didn't, you know, we talk about how horrible the U.S. was. Canada just, you know, they're the only country that's actually in noncompliance with the protocol. At least we had the, you know, the, the integrity to say we quit. <laughs> and that we're not going to join. They quit. Yeah. To, uh, to kind of co-opt regional organizations in, in helping with that kind of enforcement? Like, have there been moves to try and get aspects of Rio, for instance, incorporated in the OAS? Or, I mean, how much partnership is there there, if any? Yeah, so there has been, but mostly you see it in the UN Economic Commission for Europe. Uh, and you see it in the, in, in the Europe region, less so here. Um, partly because of the political and economic divides are greater here than they are in Europe. And one example for that, for example, is if you, if you trace the Rio Principle 10, which is the environmental democracy principle, the, um, which I think I included in the handout I gave you. Um, uh, it's a principle that uh, relates to access to information, access to um, public participation, and access to justice. Um, that was adopted at Rio. It was the first time that the world's countries embraced public participation, access to information in such a broad way. It was the first international document that actually included those principles, and certainly in the environmental context. And then the, at regionally, Europe picked up on it and negotiated the Aarhus Convention on uh, a binding convention, taking those three principles, or principle 10, the three parts of it, and operationalizing it through a binding treaty. So you can actually see the migration of that norm from a soft law norm to Europe taking it regionally. The OAS, by contrast, there's been talk about doing that same thing here regionally, but we can't get, there's not a political consensus to do it. The political consensus was quick in Europe, partly because of the um, experience they'd had in Central and Eastern Europe, where access to information was so blocked and they saw that as a real driver for why they had such environmental contamination. Here we don't have the political consensus. And then, uh, so they talk about it in soft law terms, but regionally. The OAS summits on sustainable development, they'll talk about their commitment to Rio Principle 10. They'll talk about the need to do this. And then at Rio Plus 20, the uh, Southern Cone countries propose a convention, uh, an instrument on uh, operationalizing Principle 10, essentially. And they're, so, they're, so it's taking a little longer, but so it does happen, but it's, but it's um, then you're subject to the regional politics. And within this hemisphere, you've got real problems with the regional politics. I mean, all you have to do is look at the history with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. This is another thing about, about the, the, the strength of, of uh, sanctions. So look at the Inter-American you know, Inter Commission and Court on Human Rights. We think of that as a binding regime with binding sanctions that governments will follow. And then all you have to do is look at the Belamonte Dam case in Brazil, where the commission and court came out or the commission at least, um, and the court came out against um, Brazil uh, and said they violated human rights around the construction of this dam. And Brazil said, well, we'll pull out of the commission. And created a tremendous political crisis and, and teaming with Venezuela, no offense to the Ecuadorians, Bolivia and Ecuador, not right now the champions of democracy in every way. And they, and they joined with them and they said, we don't like the whole human rights system. And, there was, and created a crisis, which they barely survived at the Inter-American Commission. So we have to recognize the limits of what we thought was a binding sanctioning regime. And, and you know, it's all a process. But what I want us to say is that this bright line between the formulaic view of what is binding and what's not, we should think of it as a continuum and recognize that, that sometimes, like the Biodiversity Convention, it's a pretty soft document. It's very hard to figure out how you're going to enforce anything because there's no clear commitment, there's no clear time frame. But then, 
there's other, other places where we, where we get governments to do that. And I think the future of governance, not just, and possibly the climate regime, is going to be embrace this a little bit more. I'll give you a couple of examples now. Well, first off, the examples of the partnerships that happen at these big summits. So starting in Johannesburg, and then again in Rio Plus 20, the governments, uh, you know, they, they knew going in that they weren't going to be able to negotiate a binding treaty. The US going into Johannesburg, they didn't, weren't going to send the president. President Bush said, I don't do international. I don't want to show up and let everybody yell at me for dropping out of the Kyoto Protocol. I'm not that, you know, I'm, uh, I'll send Colin Powell. Um, so the UN was celebrating the anniversary. They had a great gig set up. They had, you know, Nelson Mandela hosting. I mean, this is like, you want to hold a party, you get Nelson Mandela, maybe rest in peace, um, to host the party, and then world leaders will come. And you do it in post-apartheid South Africa, a feel-good story if ever there was one in, in 2002. You got Nelson hosting, and it's, and it's all political. Why did, they, why did they want it there? Why was he, they so happy that he'd be the host? Because that would mean that world leaders would come. And if world leaders came, they'd need to say something. And that would drive political pressure to do something meaningful at the 10th anniversary of, Rio, of, of the first Earth Summit. And, and, and that's, that's sort of the game. I mean, I can tell you, sit down with the UN at the time, it's like the 10th anniversary is coming up. What are we going to do? Well, let's, find a, let's try to get the world leaders there. And you know, there's two ways to do that, create a really good agenda. But unfortunately, the US didn't want anything binding on the agenda. Or create a really good venue for them to show up at. And so South Africa with Nelson was a great venue. And Tony Blair immediately said he was coming. And then you know, other world leaders said, we're going to come. And once you've got the world leaders coming, then you've got a little bit of you know, you can build some pressure on them. It's the same concept, actually, behind the fact that everybody, if you follow climate, what are we all aiming towards right now? Paris in 2015. Why Paris? Because the government set that date. So we're building political pressure. We're building political will. And that's not coming from State Departments. That's coming from the outside. It's coming from what you guys do in New York. It comes from what we do in, Paris, in, in Lima. It comes from people running around like traffic and showing where people have made their commitments or haven't made their commitments, following whether all the money that was promised in Copenhagen has been given. All this stuff is aimed towards a schedule that we know about. And that schedule is 2015. So this tremendous effort, and that they make it publicly, and that they report and monitor it publicly, and that we can at least name and shame them, that we create this cloud of commitments. And Jacob will talk more about that when he comes. But that's a, that's a traffic-like in other words, an NGO effort on the outside to say to the governments, oh, we're going to embarrass you badly in your own country, hit you in the polls if you don't live up to your commitments. And that's, you know, that's using... The measure of like, success is to actually go out and like, measure like, what countries are doing. And I guess the point I'm bringing up is it just seems as if um, these commitments and things like that don't really, if you, if you lump them all together, that, that they don't necessarily mean, I mean, sometimes they mean something, but sometimes they don't. And so it's almost as if, I guess what I'm struggling with is, it's together, does that mean that they don't really mean anything at all? No, because sometimes they mean something and sometimes they don't. And, <laughs> and, 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 the, and, the, and the indicator of whether they do or not is not whether they're in a hard law document or not. Right. That's my point. Actually, it's part of my point. What, what makes a difference is what the rest of international society does around those commitments. Um, because the enforceability of them is dependent on people paying attention. And not just states paying attention, but also states. I mean, states, states are part of the dialogue. But should, be, should, should, the, it almost, should almost the, the approach be to get countries and nations to domestically commit to things as opposed to internationally commit to things? Well, of course. Yeah, and maybe you can bring in corporations. Yeah. A lot of people from COGOT here. Yeah, corporations as well. And I say, of course, because one of the big mistakes we made in the climate negotiations, I mean, and, and, and you know, we're in international politics, and I'll bring in the, the private sector as well. Um, you know, the theory behind the Kyoto Protocol and the um, climate regime was, like, the, the theory of social change was we'll get an international negotiation and that will drive domestic change in the United States. I don't know any time where international negotiation has really driven domestic change in the United States. I mean, it's a very, you know, that was our theory of change. We all worked on it. I worked on it. I spent, 
years on Kyoto, and I, you know, my idea, we had an administration that, at that point, in the Clinton administration that seemed to be one that we could work, but our fund, it must have been, our, so, our theory of social change was, at least for the US, was that we will get the change in Kyoto commitment, and then that will be enough political force to force change back in the US. And that was a stupid theory of social change for the US. Now, it's not so stupid for other countries where international relations and law are more uh, central to their, to, to their, um, uh, to, to the power in the country, to the economics. They're more dependent on international systems. They're more internationally focused. But in the US, we're a country of international exceptionalism. And so if you want to change, if you want to force a binding climate regime internationally, you have to change US domestic politics. You have to go from the bottom up. Now, that's changed a little bit. I mean, um, to some extent. Uh, not, maybe not the binding issue, but it's one reason why there's some hope that we'll see stronger commitments. You've got Secretary of State Kerry, who understands climate change and has made it a high priority of his Secretary of Stateship. And so in some respects, we have, the problem is that we don't have congressional legislation. So they've got a, they've got a problem. They've got to make commitments and they, don't, they still don't have the domestic commitment to impose it in national law. But, but we should really understand that the idea that you'll create international law, and because of its binding nature, you'll get the US to change its energy policy, isn't right. Because the sanctions aren't going to be tough enough, and they won't agree to them if they are. And we've seen that. But, so that doesn't mean that we throw out the whole thing. It's that we have to have a real politic view of international law. And it may mean that we give up the binding nature of the treaty in order to get clear commitments with a timetable with some soft law stuff around it. Uh, and then we work on the domestic politics as we go along. And that also answers the China thing as well. Maybe China will come to agreement. Now, um, uh, the other aspect of this, if we, so I'll, I'll get the private sector in a little bit. I want to say one other thing first about, if you want to see examples of this, the partnerships are one example. There's also the open government partnership um, which uh, Professor Fox and the and SIS and others work on and, and recognize, but um, the Open Government Partnership was a decision um, by, uh, was an agreement by the US, Brazil, one of the Nordics, Ghana, I think, some other countries. They got together about five or six years ago and they all agreed um, that they would all improve the transparency of their governance. They didn't negotiate exactly what the standards would be. What they negotiated was they all agreed that they would take, that they would announce steps to take to improve the transparency of their governance. That was the first agreement. The second agreement was that the richer countries would put some money into, into a fund for others to help. They didn't get it automatically, but there would be some funding available. But that they would cooperate in helping each other. And they created a reporting mechanism and a civil society external kind of review reporting process for it as well. No binding treaty, not hard law. And now they've got, I don't know, I'm going to just make this up so you can go check it out, the open government. I think they've got 20, 30, 40, 50 countries that have agreed to do it. And they're moving governance changes and transparency without ever having to sit down for five years and negotiate a hard law and standards. And they wouldn't have been able to anyways because the countries were at totally different levels and their transparency. And if they negotiate the minimum standard, it's going to mean nothing for the US. It's actually a better thing that, you know, yeah, the US could accept it, but it didn't, wouldn't change anything in our law. Here, the US has to commit to doing something different than it was. And the commitment is sort of, it's not binding. There's no, it's not international law, but it's international governance. And there's a naming and shaming. And Brazil and NGOs will together come together and say, you really done a promise to us. And Brazil's a really important partner, and we don't want to be seen that way. So most countries will comply with most of their obligations most of the time, and they'll probably do it whether it's binding or not binding. So that's one example. In the climate area, the um, CCAC, the uh, Clean Air Coalition, I forget what it's called, Climate and Clean Air Coalition or something like that, are working on methane and working on black carbon. Uh, and uh, they didn't wait for a, a binding treaty, and they've got countries doing the same thing, coming together and agreeing that they'll each take steps to deal with these particular carbon pollutants, and then that they'll support one another, but they'll also report against one another. Um, and so you can build governance that isn't 
in this traditional structure, governance that takes advantage of things like traffic or the 70,000 people that are going to, the, to Lima to, to talk about climate, build them into a, a regime of monitoring and verification. It's a much more open thing. And then when you, so governments are doing that. And then when you overlay the public-private partnerships, and this gets to the private sector, then you've got a whole new set of actors who you can bring into also into something that, again, isn't formal public international law, but might have real binding kind of consequences for it. So for example, one of my favorites is um, um, you know, creating environmental standards at the International Finance Corporation of the World Bank. It's an international organization. It issues environmental and social standards, and it imposes it in its loans to private sector companies. And so it's not international law, but it is, it is got a binding nature to it because it's part of the private contract between the IFC and the, and the company. Now, I would like to be able to enforce it as a third party community activist. I haven't quite got that yet, but, um, uh, but still, if I can keep the pressure on, they'll have a relationship there. Or you take something like the Walmart effect. If you get Walmart to change its, even if it's not binding, if you can get Walmart to change one of its products or processes, you can have a huge impact. And one of the things that you were saying is, that I totally agree with is, keep the focus on the impact. Forget the form of how we do it. Let's figure out how we get impact on the ground. And if that means letting countries off the hook from a binding regime, but we get more impact, then we should do it, except we have to get more impact. I mean, the question, it, it, doesn't, it begs the question of whether you get more or less from the binding versus non-binding. But the point is that we've got a, it's a much more rich and diverse landscape to work on, especially when you bring in the private sector. And so if you, you, know, you want to make a change, you know, yeah, maybe you can get the governments to change, or maybe you get Walmart to change. And that makes a global environmental change, because they start working through their suppliers and their supply chains, and they have a huge impact, much bigger than you could have through negotiating with the governments. And so you see a lot of environmental activism working on that way. Or you see public-private partnerships. So that's when the UN opens up and says, OK, you know, what can we do in cooperation with the government? But there again, going back to keeping in mind what we mean by, it's not that I want to give up on enforcement. It's I want those public-private partnerships to be clear, have a time frame, a commitment, a promise, public and transparent, and let the Greenpeace and traffics of the world police it. I don't trust governments anymore to, to, to police it or be progressive enough to do it. I trust more all of us and the social society to do it. We have to win in society. So, um, and the targets might be governments, they might be private sector, uh, which is not traditional international law, but it is got some binding consequences to it if it's tied into a supply chain or if we can you know, put enough people in the streets, if you cut up the Citibank credit cards, then before you know it, they want to have environmental standards for their lending in the Amazon. Um, you know, that's a kind of enforcement. And, you know, and in that respect, they then went and negotiated an agreement with Rainforest Action Network. Uh, is it binding? Yeah, I don't know if I'd want to go into a court of law, but if you're Rainforest Action Network, the binding enforcement aspect of it is that if they breach the agreement, we're back with all the college kids ripping up their credit cards again. I mean, that's enforcement. That is enforcement. It's better enforcement than we've got on the sanction side, and it doesn't always come from law. It's a set of policy and law with some pretty clever enforcement from the rest of us on the side. Um, and when we reach the private sector, we get, you know, we, we get a lot, uh, some, some pretty clever strategies and things like that. Well, I know you didn't do the, the principles, but maybe they're self-explanatory. I want to do one principle. Okay. It's 208. Can I do one principle? Because it explains climate change in a way. Can I do one principle? And then I'll take questions. Whoops. That's the release form. That's not my principle. Um, if you want to understand part of the politics, or, or I think the most part of the politics, I'm going to break this, chip, this table. Um, it's getting heavier year to year. But these tables are getting weaker, one or the other. Um, uh, I, want, I want to talk for a minute about principle seven. Because principle seven tells us a lot about the history and scope of of international environmental law. There's a lot hidden in this principle, so give me a few minutes to talk about it. It doesn't seem to say very much at first. But the first part is states shall cooperate in a spirit of global partnership to conserve, protect, and restore the health and integrity of the Earth's ecosystem. So this is the idea of a global partnership. Now, why was that important? And what was the partnership they were talking about? 
1992 at Rio, when they wrote this, the partnership was between essentially the North and the South, industrialized and developing countries, rich and poor, divided up however you want. But it was basically those countries whose priorities were clearly poverty alleviation, health, literacy, um, just basically lifting their people out of poverty. And the industrialized countries who were facing an environmental um, problems for the first time due to industrialization. And when they got together at Rio, again, without the optics of the East-West uh, uh, agenda and able to have this conversation about the North-South dynamic, um, they had to come to some compromises around this and to reach this global partnership. So they reached this global partnership. But what was the terms of the partnership? What, and the partnership was what, what would make the South join with the North in making environmental protection a priority? That's another question. Why would they make that a priority? Because it wasn't a priority for them otherwise. And the, and the North wanted it to be more of one. So the partnership was the contours around how they would, if they were going to form a partnership, what would be the contours of it? And you see that in, the, in both much of the Rio Declaration. It kind of outlines the partnership. But you see it implicitly in the, in the rest of, the, of this principle. In view of the different contributions to global environmental degradation, states have common but differentiated responsibilities. So this becomes the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. And it's a very important political principle, not legal. There's a lot of debate about whether it has legal obligations or not. But, uh, and I don't really think it's a legal principle, but I think it's the most important political principle to understand sustainable development and environmental politics right now and through the last 20 years. Um, they have common, so the partnership is we all have responsibilities, but they're different. And why are they different? Developed countries acknowledge the responsibility that they bear in the international pursuit of sustainable development in view of the pressures of society's place and the resources they command. And the, global, and the technologies and financial resources they command. So why are they common but differentiated? Two reasons. North, you caused it, the environmental problems, and you, got, and you got wealthy off of it, so you have the technologies and finances to pay for it. So the partnership is we're all going to share in the process, but you're going to go first, and you're going to pay for it north. Why? Because you caused the problem. We didn't, whatever the problem is, but global environmental degradation. And you've got the money to, to solve it. And they came to this principle and this idea of the partnership really from the negotiations of the Montreal Protocol and the London revisions in 1990. Because the formula that they got to get all the developing countries to agree to phase out those important refrigeration chemicals and to address air conditioning, something that they needed desperately in these countries, but why were they going to phase out this chemical for ozone depletion, this distant problem? The formula they came up with was, well, we're going to do it first. We're going to help you with technology transfer and alternatives. We're going to give you 10 extra years always or more to comply. So you're going to go second. And we're going to provide all incremental costs of your compliance. So your transition, all incremental costs. This was the formula under the Montreal Protocol. It relates to that facilitative approach that the Montreal Protocol has in compliance that I mentioned. The reason why developing countries joined the Montreal Protocol regime was because the sanctions weren't too tough but instead tied around giving us financing and helping us, helping us come into compliance, facilitative. So we took that experience and we generalized it in the Rio Declaration. And then we took the generalized principle in the Rio Declaration and we placed it squarely in the Framework Convention on Climate Change. So this principle is written once again in a binding document. So again, if we go binding versus not binding, it's the same principle. But now in climate change, apparently it's binding all of a sudden because it's in the, in the binding principle, although in Rio, when, when, the, when the US agreed to Rio, they dropped a footnote and they said, yeah, we might be more responsible for this under principle seven, but that no means makes us legally responsible. They, dropped a, they held up their hand when they signed it and they said, we're not legally responsible. This isn't a legal principle. So I don't know that it suddenly becomes a legal principle just because it's in the climate. It's also, I think, um, no, I think it's not in the, I think it's in, uh, in the actual article. So that principle has become the, the rallying point or has become an organizing principle for the negotiations. And the theory behind the, the Kyoto Protocol and the Framework Convention, the theory we were all operating under was science would give us a cap. Science would tell us how much we could emit. 
the northern countries would then get together and agree first to live under a cap. And so that process was going along pretty well until Kyoto. It wasn't really the cap we would need, but science was telling us the cap. The industrialized countries agreed in Kyoto to operate under a binding cap. And then the idea was, subject to common but differentiated responsibilities, industrialized countries would go first. We'd set up things like the climate fund and, and, the, and the same principle of all incremental costs. And, and then the developing countries would come along in round two of the Kyoto Protocol. Everything's going along swimmingly except for two problems have happened, one in particular. One is the development of China, but before that, what happened to the promise of common but differentiated responsibilities? The US pulls out of Kyoto. 500 votes in Florida means that Bush wins, means that uh, he is uh, early on in January of 2000 announces we're not going to be a party to Kyoto. And that means then that the rest of the world says, well, the partnership of Rio of 1992 just blew apart, at least for climate change. And we're not coming back to the table. China's not coming back to the table in the G77. Rightly so, I would have argued until recently. Rightly so, they're not going to come back to the table until the US lives up to their obligations. And their obligation is to go first, and we'll come along second. That has blocked, that, that was always the underlying part of the negotiations leading up to Copenhagen and through. Now that what's changed, the second thing that's changed, so the first thing that's changed is that the industrialized countries didn't live up to their commitment, particularly the US. I'd say the other industrialized countries, with the exception of Canada and now Australia, probably did live up to their commitment. And it would have been a very different dialogue if all of them were able to come forward to the G77 in China and say, look, we're taking our steps. We're going to take more steps. We're doing what we've said to do. Now it's all of your turn. I think it would have been a different discussion. Maybe it wouldn't have had a different outcome, but it would have been a very different discussion than the discussion that says, look, we went first. And China and India and Brazil say, well, some of you went first. We're still waiting for some of you to take that step you promised in 1992, and we don't see it. And so, you know, we're not talking, or we're talking in a different way. We're not taking our binding commitments because you've not taken your binding commitments. And so, you know, that, that, that unraveled, and they've been trying to hold it together. Now the, now, the second part of the problem is exactly what you say. Now China, India, and Brazil, they say the same thing. But if you look at the predicates for the common but differentiated responsibilities, it's a little hard to defend their position if you're China. It gets getting a little harder. Because the predicate is, you caused it, and you've got all the resources. Now, if we take a snapshot today, you've got China as the number one annual emitter and growing really rapidly. You've got India and Brazil um, uh, emissions going up, at least nationally, not per capita. But, um, and moreover, you've got them expressing their financial clout. They want to have a bigger role in the World Bank. They have the BRICS Bank. They, they're talking about the resources that they now command to do international development. So the two predicates, the US says, they don't exist anymore. You want to be part of the G20 and the major economies forum? Then put up some money, says the US. We're not paying for the incremental costs anymore. You guys want to push your weight around in the World Bank? Don't think this isn't the conversation. This is the conversation. You want more voting power and you don't like the way that the world is? Put your money up. They say, we're going to put it up in the BRICS Bank. And the US says, and by the way, you've got enough money for a BRICS Bank. We're not paying the incremental costs because we don't have all the financial resources anymore. And so these things come together. And, and, and you know, from Brazil, India, and China's point, point of view, they will say, OK, give us more political power in the economic uh, institutions and other things, and we'll take on more economic power. We won't take money uh, out of the climate regime in order to meet our climate responsibilities, but we don't want to be reported or verified either. But the predicates have changed. So the US very explicitly, and I find it it's interesting. Why do they do it? Because there's something to these principles that, if not legal, are at least really important politically and I think quasi-legally, the US felt like they had to address all the people shouting that you violated the, this non-binding principle. So the US explicitly came out and said, we still favor common but differentiated responsibilities, but we think the differentiation now is going to have to be a little more refined. China and India, you're not sub-Saharan Africa. And so we're going to have to we're going to have to rethink what we mean by common but differentiated responsibilities. And here's the problem. Nobody knows what the outcome of that is. At Rio, we understood what it meant. You go first, you pay, because we understood from the Montreal Protocol. Now we're up negotiating, and they say, we're throwing open the partnership, and we're throwing open what we mean by this organizing political principle, and we don't know what it means yet. We don't know what it means to give China, Brazil, and India more power and, and, and also more responsibility. With power comes responsibility, the US would say. And, and, and so, 
We're at this point where if you really want to understand why I think consensus on a binding document is so hard, one of the reasons is that we don't have agreement on the politics, on the, on the basic framework for what the conceptual framework for agreement would be. And it's interesting to me that this principle, legal or not, hard or not, continues to have, but it's, it's arguably hard because it's in the framework convention, continues to play this really important role in shaping how we think about negotiations. I mean, there's other things going on, but that makes it very hard to figure out how you're going to reach a global cap or, or reach some other thing. And the, and the outcome instead is that they've, they've shifted to a different governance formula, which is the Copenhagen Accord kind of uh, individual commitments, pledge and review. I give you a pen, take the pen, walk up to the board, tell me what you're willing to do. We're not going to negotiate it. Um, that's, that's what the pledge and review is. Every country gets a pen, every country gets to go up and write, but every country agrees to do something. And then we'll write about it. By the way, if you want money, we're going to tie some more binding kind of sanction type stuff. Like if you want money, we're going to report, investigate, and verify you. If you're going to do it on your own, state sovereignty will stay away from you. And so you've got this squeezing of hard and soft law. It's not, it's, the hardness comes in with the condition on the lending. Not in any kind of, but, but it's harder. And so that's where we are, I think, there as well. But it's motivated as well by this principle. And I, I see now that we're at 2.20. I'll take a question, or, or do we need to? It's 2.30 like 2.20? Do we have to get out Yeah, of let's see like what they call any burning questions. And somebody who hasn't yet, or a comment, if you like. All right, any less burning questions? <laughs> Hi, I'm just wondering, um, what are some of your future predictions or mm -hmm. hopes for um, international environmental law? Yeah. And why don't we take a couple of them? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, somebody over here, go ahead. <laughs> to add to her question, I just specifically wanted to hear about predictions about the US role in COP20 um, in Lima. One more? One more? OK, that's enough. Um, Well, I think the U.S. has, for a change, and this will come as a shock because I'm a pretty big critic usually, I think the U.S. actually has a story to tell in COP20. And I think the story that it has to tell, some of it's just economic and some of it's not, is that they've made bigger, more real cuts than countries that were working under binding obligations. Um, and that we're probably going to meet our Copenhagen commitments or we're going to get close to it. Um, and so... That's an important predicate to credibility. Now, um, and the US is going to try to, I mean, I think the US is going to try to have that story and use it to try to isolate China, India, and, and to a lesser extent Brazil. Um, but I don't think we're going to see the original vision anytime soon of a science-based cap that we negotiate across countries. I think it's just too hard politically. Um, that, you know, that was the Kyoto model. Um, you know, if you're negotiating with the U.S., why on earth would you think that we could ratify any agreement that you would actually agree to? I mean, why would you sit down and negotiate with the U.S. Uh, if, if you think the outcome has to be a ratified treaty? I mean, you're a fool. If you're, and these countries aren't fools. So even as they use that rhetoric, I mean, this is one of the other real politics of the situation. The U.S. is not going to negotiate to a treaty that needs to be ratified through the U.S. Senate. Because, and, and who wants them to at this point? I mean, let's just understand. I mean, we can't get anything through the U.S. Senate. Literally nothing. And so that, that hamstrings us in a way unless we're willing to embrace some different model. And the U.S. is pushing for some different model that will have some legal aspects to it but won't require ratification. And so I, I, you know, I, I don't know that I want to predict. A lot of it still comes down to money. I mean, if you want to know the, other, the real practical negotiation. So you've now set up the Green Climate Fund. Um, it's all ready. It's empty. It's sitting there. You know, what developing countries, they don't really care about the binding, whether it's binding or not binding in the commitments. A lot of the developing countries want to see real dollars in the bank to pay for their transition. You know, and they want that to be binding. And we're actually, for the first time, talking about how we monitor how much money, what, whether a promise or a commitment to give money. And it's not, it, it's not like, you know, they're just doing it for the money. It's, it's part of the deal. It's also part of the reality. We do it. We are rich, and we should help poor countries deal with this transition from cheap coal to more expensive whatever. You know, if we want to solve it, we're going to have to put up real money. So if you want to watch, if you want to see whether something meaningful is going to happen, 
follow the commitments of pledges of money. Um, uh, because that's, the pledges of money will be conditioned on, you know, getting developing countries to pledge more. And they'll pledge more if they're getting more money for it. And then follow the, the different pledges as we go forward. I mean, I think the problem with the pledges is that the U.S. can, I think they have a good story to tell, and, they, and they've got an administration that will make a, a decent pledge. But then, of course, the administration will be gone, and we won't have any, any formal way of implementing it. So whether we can, you know, it comes back to the domestic pressure we can continue to build or, or, or support here. Again, if we want to solve climate change, we've got to win it domestically. We don't win it in Paris. I, I, maybe I just feel burned by that. And then as far as international environmental law generally, sorry, I want to answer that question as well. You know, there's some, I get off on funny things that are like not, um, I do like this new governance model. I think we can do a lot with um, uh, a governance model that is less hung up on whether it's a binding treaty and more hung up on the trappings of, of enforceability, clear commitments, clear timelines. So take, for example, the Arctic Council meetings that will take place here and will be in the presidency. So in the next couple of years, will be a lot happening on the Arctic. You know, there, they could try to negotiate a really comprehensive treaty or they could try to set up a governance structure of commitments. Um, and I think, I think I'd like to see more of that. I'm very interested in how we continue to pressure the private sector. It's not international law, but for me, that's very interesting. And I'd like to see more avenues for um, ways to, to engage constructively, although I, don't, I think litigation is very constructive. So my definition of constructive is how to sue them into submission. It includes that. If you sue them on the right, you can have a constructive negotiation on the left. Um, uh, and I really want to see a successful lawsuit on climate change damage. Well, last week we had uh, somebody use the necessity defense. Did you guys hear that? This is an international law. This is domestic law. Anybody hear about the necessity defense? Is this the Clean Air Act lit litigation that you're talking about? No, it was the um, lobster boat bl blockade. Before you go up to New York and protest, you should know this. So the lobster men, this, these two lobster men took off at harbor and blocked a, um, blocked a coal boat, a, a, a ship full of coal blocked the harbor, and then they were arrested for and faced some pretty nasty criminal sanctions. And they argued, as, as had some formerly in the UK, um, that actually their defense was necessity because of climate change. It was a necessity to block this coal plant, and that that was going to be their defense to the criminal liability for doing it. And they're getting all, gearing all up. Matt Powell is representing them, who also represented the uh, islanders or the villages of Kivalina in the case out in California to try to bring climate litigation there. And um, right before the trial, the judge said he was going to allow the evidence in on the necessity of global warming. So that was a big victory. And the DA, small town DA, stood up, withdrew the charges, actually uh, pled, pled, pled him out to a $2,000 um, little fine, and then made this beautiful announcement about how he agreed with the necessity defense. This is a little DA in Middlesex, Massachusetts. And, and he agreed to the necessity of defense. We should all do what we can do to climate change. And he's dropping the rest of the charges against the defense. It was, you know, it was, it was great. So I like things like that. I mean, <laughs> it's not big international law. But I'll tell you, it's, um, uh, there's international law and there's global law. So that necessity defense came from the UK. It's being talked about in other countries right now. It's spreading. So there's different ways to spread that aren't, that aren't about the formal going through the formal State Department lawyers, we can find ways to build legal consequences um, differently. And I'm still trying to represent, you know, I'm still waiting for that island state to allow me to sue the United States in the world court. And they're still threatening to do it, but it hasn't happened yet. But I think it will. I'm in there. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think you can see why I'm always urging you guys to go down to the law school and take a course with David. Um, and 